Good evening. This meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, March 8th, 2021 is being called to order. As a pre preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, the Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes, thank you. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Dan Dunn? Yes. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And board administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's order, executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comments, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care to not screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be cap captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak in order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes it is helpful for our participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All the meeting materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus agenda dashboard. We recommend the members in the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We now turn to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I'll in introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish, wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain items. After members have spoken, I as the chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. First, I will ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote tonight will be conducted by roll call vote. All right, and that takes us to the next item on our agenda. Discussion and approval, fiscal year 2022 water sewer rates. Mr. Chaplain. And Mr. Thank you, Rademacher. Mr. Chairman. So I will ask Mr. Rademacher and um, Mr. Pooler to give a more in-depth presentation, but I I want to start with an introduction uh, to just describe to the board what, we're, what we'll be asking the board to do tonight. Um, in broad strokes, we'll be asking the board to consider voting uh, favorably for rate increases for both water and sewer rates. Uh, the board will likely recall that this year will be the second year in what is a three-part or three-year strategy to reduce what we call the MWRA debt shift which is money that was raised on the tax rate, but used to subsidize or reduce uh, water and sewer rates. Going back a few years with the elimination, or excuse me, the cap uh, of the federal, state, and local tax deduction, uh, keeping that 
MWRA debt shift in place became uh, much less beneficial to Arlington taxpayers and ratepayers. Uh, so the board started several years ago asking myself, Mr. Rademacher and Mr. Pooler to develop a plan for the board's consideration of how to reduce and eventually eliminate that debt shift. Ultimately, the board settled on a three-year strategy so that there wouldn't be rate shock or dramatic rate impacts in any one given year. And the ultimate plan was decided upon to do it over the course of three years. And again, this is the second year um, as part of that three-year plan. One last thing I wanna point out before asking Mike to provide a little further detail is that though the percentage increases that Mike will detail um, are undoubtedly large, uh, the water sewer budget this uh, proposed for FY22 only represents a 2.7% increase in expenses. Uh, so for any anybody listening at home, um, the increases that we're asking the board to vote tonight are not based on increased expenses for operating the water and sewer budget, but again, rather they're based on the way we are collecting. So our, not arguably, we will be collecting more water and sewer dollars, but less impact on the tax rate. Uh, so there is this is not more or new money being asked to be raised, but shifting how we're collecting a set amount of money. So with that said, um, Mike, would you like to walk through uh, in any greater detail that you think is necessary to explain the memo you've provided? Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Um, good evening, um, Select Board. I, um, uh, Adam had pretty very well summed up uh, where we're at and where we're heading with this. Uh, and as the, the memo stated, the, the increases um, are entirely the, the majority of the increases is, is based upon the shifting or the elimination of the the, uh, the shift of tax dollars to the to the um, uh, enterprise fund uh, i'm sure you've all read the memo but just as a summary we're, we're looking to increase the water rates by 12.75 percent and the sewer rates by just under 12 percent and those uh, values were calculated based on expected uh, expenses and um, and offsetting that with uh, necessary uh, rate revenue. Thank you. Okay. And anything additional before I go to the board? No. Sandy, do you have anything you want to? No. All right, uh, Mr. Corsi. Hey, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, first of all, I'll move approval of the um, of the rates contained in the memorandum. Um, and just a couple of additional comments. And thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine, for um, discussing what, what really is a shift of how revenue is, is earned in the uh, Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. And, and for those of you who've been following this the past couple of years, through fiscal 20, there was about $5.5 .5 million um, that was a subsidy from real estate taxes to the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. That went down to $3.6 million for fiscal 21. It's going down to $1.8 million for fiscal 22. And you see it in rates because this, this amount is a, is a greater percentage of the revenues for the water and sewer fund than it is as a percentage of total real estate taxes. But um, if, if, if for the members of the board, if you remember back in December when Mr. Tierney came in, to talk about the tax rate and, and had us vote and approve the tax rate. We approved the tax rate of $11.34 uh, for this past year. If we hadn't shifted um, additional or we hadn't decreased the shift from the uh, real estate taxes to the water and sewer enterprise fund, that rate would have been about $11.50. So that's where you see it in the difference. It's in the tax rate. You're gonna see higher water and sewer rates, but as Mr. Chapdelaine and Mr. Rademacher have, have indicated, it's only a 2.7% increase in the total expenses of the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. Um, it's just a difference in, in how it's collected. And we feel that this is a better way to present what's actually being paid for water and sewer. It's more open and transparent. Um, and it's the ratepayers that are paying this rather than the taxpayers subsidizing um, the, these costs, and, and there are some ratepayers that don't pay real estate taxes, exempt organizations, for example, that will be participating fully. And it does um, really give a truer indication of what the um, 
the expenses are for water and sewer. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. So I am uh, I'm happy to second this. I'm happy to support it. And I think I'm gonna say uh, it in a slightly different way, which is I actually think that these rate changes are about fairness. And the reason we're moving it off the tax rate and onto the water bill is because it is related to your water usage. And so the more water you use, the more you pay. And that wasn't true as exactly in the old system. It is now closer to true and it'll be even closer yet next year. Um, and on the subject of fairness, we also, uh, I've received an email forwarded from the board's office just this afternoon. And I'm not sure that everyone will have had a chance to, to read it. But um, the, there was a resident who was upset, that, that I think is the correct word, that uh, they're charged for sewage rates, even though they're just watering their lawn. And the, the argument goes, you know, I'm not, I'm not paying for sewage treatment for this water that I'm using to water my lawn. Why, why are you charging me a sewer rate? And uh, on the face of it, that makes a lot of sense. You say, okay, why, you're right. We shouldn't figure, we shouldn't be charging you for the sewer rate. But the thing is, is that in the end, it is coming, that does come out to a closer number about fairness. And the reason is, is because a lot of the cost of building our water infrastructure is built, a lot of the cost is needing to provide water during peak usage. And it is particularly about things like watering your lawn. And so while the label is wrong, we shouldn't necessarily call it a sewage rate. I really have no problem with charging um, people significantly for watering their lawn. It's a, it's a luxury, it is not a necessity, and it is something that uh, shouldn't be borne by your neighbors. If you're the person, if you want to water your lawn, you should be paying for it, not your neighbors. And so I'm gonna, um, I'm, I look forward to the day where we have more flexibility in our, how we charge and calculate our sewage, water and sewer rates, such that we can more better understand what our peak is and perhaps charge people as a fraction of their peak usage and things like that. Uh, but until then, I'm comfortable that even though we're charging sewage rates on uh, lawn watering, we are in fact charging a closer to fair rate with this change than we ever have uh, before. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? Um, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to assume in Mr. Tukorsi's motion. Seconded by Mr. Dunn. And I was just wondering if maybe Mr. Rademacher or, or someone else would speak to this that um, inherent in, in that is that um, pending the future projections, um, sort of remaining the course, if they don't, that this will come back up for review. That's my first question. Uh, um, uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I am assuming you're talking about the assumptions we made in the, in the rate calculation. And yes. those were conservative. If anything, if anything holds true, I, I, I feel that we would be able to bring them down uh, and not necessarily up. So, uh, if 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 for some reason we find we can be a little more advantageous, we could come to the board with that with that rate. Okay. And um, my second question would be: I'm still unmuted. Good. <laughs> this is a three-year projection, um, and sort of a outlook into a fourth, if just taking the worst possible case scenario that um, come that fourth year, that it's really um, skewed radically uh, in terms of having to make larger increases, uh, what steps are we contemplating um, if that should be the case? I, I, my assumption is we're, we're taking that what we're seeing over the course of these three years will continue on in year four, five, and six if it doesn't. Uh, I, oh, go ahead, Adam. I, I, I was going to take a shot at that, if that's okay, um, yeah. Mike. I mean, I, I think the two major variables that we contend with in the water sewer budget are the MWRA assessments. That's the the dramatic lion's share of what we of what we have to pay for. Um, I, Mike can speak better to what the long range outlook is, but my understanding is um, they've been managing their debt and their expenses quite well. So. Uh, shocks in terms of our MWRA assessment is probably limited risk. The other side of risk for us is if usage was to go way down, uh, we would likely still have much of that fixed cost from the MWRA because it's based 
much more on the debt they're paying for Deer Island and the water system than it is for the actual water there with the water that we're receiving or sewer that we're giving. Um, but if our usage went down for any number of reasons, um, that could impact us negatively in terms of total collected and then mean that rates would have to go higher to be able to pay the bills. Um, I, I don't know, and Mike, you could speak to this a little more. I'm, if this pandemic uh, in the resulting economic impact hasn't dramatically seen usage come down, I'm not sure that we, there's a high risk for usage to come down, although you can't rule anything out. So I, I think we're in fairly good position to, to be able to stick somewhere in the vicinity of Mike's estimates. But Mike, if you want, if I've missed anything on that, please feel free. Mm -hmm. No, you um, you explain that very well. I do feel the MWRA is uh, doing a, a very good job, especially under the um, oversight of the MWRA executive committee, keeping them on their toes. The executive committee is made up of member communities, which um, comments and um, and uh, makes recommendations on MWRA rates and is, has the community's interests at, 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 at heart. So the MWRA and the, the advisory board have been very good at trying to reduce the uh, assessment increases year over year and have been bringing those down. Um, but Adam is also correct that, uh, so aside from that, our biggest unknown is use. In a, in a year of um, drought, people use more water and in, in a wet year, we, they use less water and there's a lot, not too much we can do about that. But uh, other than just ride those peaks and valleys um, and, and try to average them out over the years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, just a couple of small things. You know, um, with respect to that letter, I thought the premise was interesting, and that was that um, keeping the lawn green um, helps property values and does a service to the town. Uh, by doing that, uh, yeah, I see the argument, but I think um, I think maybe it should make us think about changing our mindset about that. I mean, because water, I mean, we should conserve water. And uh, uh, I mean, we're fortunate most years where we don't have a drought, but certainly when it's a drought, excuse me, a drought is severe, then people are urged not to water their lawns, and they turn brown, and brown's okay, you know. Uh, but like I said, I understand that was the premise of it. Uh, uh, the second thing is just requests. I mean, uh, humble, respectful requests uh, to those who uh, do our um, uh, visual presentations on, on that, that graph um, uh, for the uh, community charge comparisons. And I, uh, I assume the blue is for water. That would make sense. And the yellow is for sewer. That's okay. Uh, uh, I didn't see it labeled, uh, uh, and that might be an oversight of mine. But the more important thing is, is where it's, it's easy for me to compare the rates I mean, on the blue because they're all starting from zero and going to the right. I mean, for the yellow, it's hard for me to compare them because I mean, the bases aren't the same. And so you can kind of gauge which one is larger than the other. But, but if there's like a numerical value in those, it would help me to compare them. I know we have the tables, I mean, but um, a lot of times I see these charts and I'm not able to say anything because, well, you know, I'm just not in a position to say something. But in this one, in this case I am. So I just humbly request that, that uh, uh, we maybe format those a little differently so it's easier for people like me to read, read them. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. And just one question, then one comment. So where the rate's a little, the request is a little lower than projected because of reduction in the MWRA assessment due to COVID. Is that a permanent adjustment or should we assume that that, that assessment will be readjusted next year? They, um, they, that's kind of like the new bar. So it will just, they, I don't, I don't expect them to jump back up. That's the, the new benchmark and it'll, It'll grow from there. So we think that our requests for an increase next year might be a little lower than projected as well. No, I would. The future increases are built upon growing this assessment currently. Okay. All right. And then, to whatever extent we can have, I mean, this is a excellent synopsis of why we're asking for this rate increase, and we. To discuss this at length about a year ago when we talked about the debt shift in the year before that when we talked about the debt shift and so on. So if we could put this together in some sort of press release that 
is available to people. I think that would be helpful because we certainly know we're going to, as soon as this hits, there's going to be talk about how the select board increased your water rates by 12%. Mm -hmm. And I think to have this information available would be really helpful to help spread to people to show why we're doing it and the benefit that they're getting. We can, Mr. Chair, we, we can yep. absolutely do that, no question. Yep. All right, so with that, we have a motion to approve by Mr. DeCourcy, second by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Hahn. Mr. Chair, I forget, is this a public hearing or no? Nope. Okay, thank you. Attorney Hahn? Mrs. Mahal. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurt? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, and that takes us to our consent agenda. Item number three, request contract to drain layer license, Rafali Construction Corp, Gerardo A. Rafali, 233 Burrell Street, Swampscott, Massachusetts, 01907. And for approval, ACAC Utility Box Painting Project, Adria Ach, Commission for Arts and Culture, and Laurie Bogdan, Commission for Arts and Culture. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, do we have anyone to speak on the ACAC utility box painting project? I see Adria and Lori here. Would you like me to ask them sure. if they'd like to say a few words? Yep. All right, here they come. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for hearing us. Um, there we go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're into our, um, I think it's the fifth year of doing um, utility box or switch box paintings. Uh, we're, we're calling them utility boxes now. Um, so I wanted to introduce Lori Bogdan, who's a new member of our um, Arlington Public Garden, Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture group. And um, Lori is going to take over uh, running this project with my help uh, this year. So we, I'm going to let her, I'm going to let her talk. Lori, Thank you're you. on. <laughs> Hi. Um, so here we are in the next phase of this project. Uh, we have identified uh, several boxes that we're interested in working on this year, and that's going forth to the next level of, uh, of approval. And uh, we have started reaching out to the arts community to, to go through the jury process to choose designs for this year's boxes. And we are open for any questions if you have them. All right, I'll go to the board for any comments. Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Adria. And now Laurie um, for signing on to this. This has been um, one of the projects that if you look at it in totality, it's a small microcosm of the town, but I can't tell you how many people have commented on um, how much they appreciate the art. And, and that is just distributed throughout the town. East Arlington, the center and the heights. So, um, and the other thing that I know people have expressed to me was that you have, um, and I assume Laurie will continue to incorporate um, all of the different groups, um, you know, starting with our youth groups uh, moving on up um, to participate in this project. So uh, I, I wanna thank you, um, Adria and now Laurie for um, continuing this um, really, um, I know when, when you're standing, walking by on Mass Ave or waiting for a bus or talking to a neighbor or getting ready to go to church, the, this, this artwork is, is definitely appreciated. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move approval on the consent agenda. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? I will second it. And, and, and I'll, I, I really love the boxes too. And I went to the webpage uh, looking at the utility boxes. I saw a bunch of pictures, but I did not see this one. Oh, yeah. that's actually yeah. not a part of this particular project, though. That was um, commissioned separately by Friends of um, Magnolia Park. 
Oh, that's interesting. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. So, so are there any others that aren't you know part of the of the program? No, that's the only no that's the only one. Interesting. I, I did happen to meet that artist, uh, uh, and and I was um, at the time thinking I was still going to be doing my art in Arlington um, yeah. ser series, and that's how I met you, Adria. You know, but but uh, you know things just got really busy, and and now I just don't have time for it. But I will come back uh, to that series. But uh, but these are great. You know, uh, whoever does them. Uh, they're great, you know, and and it is good to see this kind of art around town. And I actually have some ideas about me, maybe ways that we can integrate this into some fun projects. And because you know, I enjoy working with you. Let's touch base sometime and and, and talk about them. So uh, yeah, so uh, cool. And 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 I know I've been talking to Adria Arch, um, Adria Laurie, you know, but I look forward to um, meeting you in person sometime and and or virtually and working through some ideas, hashing them out, all right? That's great. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. I'm a great program, happy to support. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, thank you, Adrian, Larry. It, it can really, this program has really made a big difference. And I had some people comment to me, the box on Brooks Ave was just replaced with a new box and people noticed the, uh, the the old artwork there is, is is no longer there with the removal of the box, but you can tell people really notice it. And and just one comment: looks like you may have some landscaping work you need to do on it and on Appleton and Florence. So uh, good good luck with that. In addition to the art, thanks. Yeah, I and mean, of course I'm happy to support this. Arlington, I think, is known for public art in general, and this is one of the events that I really enjoy. I have a box right across. From my office in the center and it's always interesting to see what people come up with and you're always surprised and always amazed so happy to support this again and thank you both for coming and explain the program to us you're with welcome. that attorney heim we have a motion to approve by mrs mahan second by mr diggins mrs mahan yes thank you mr de yes mr diggins yes mr dunn Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you both. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Definitely. Thank you. All right. And that takes us to item number five on our agenda for approval, food vendor license. Fatouche, 142 Massachusetts Avenue. Karam T. Tuma. Is Mr. Tuma with us? Attorney Heim. Oh, sorry, Attorney, Heim. <laughs> Attorney Leone. Good evening. I'm here with. Uh, is it Tony? Is to, should I be promoting Tony? Yes, he goes by Tony. Thank you. I'm here with uh, Karam Tuma Tony, as we know him. He's wanting to. Um, he's going to be right with us in a second. I see Tony can uh, unmute. Yeah. So we're looking to get Tony licensed for a uh, little restaurant down in East Arlington next to Za, um, where he's going to be doing takeout Mediterranean and American food, strictly takeout, uh, no eat in dining. And he's really excited about it. You've seen his menu and he's going to be re outfitting that place from scratch. So it's going to be a um, nice new clean place. And he's uh, wanting to get approval. No alcohol, just food. All right. If you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. All right, Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'll, I'll move approval subject to the conditions. Um, I have no questions. I just want to wish you the best of luck uh, with the new venture. Mr. Diggins. I will be thrilled to approve it. I did look at the menu, you know, and and uh, I just recently discovered jalapeno hummus, uh, and and I just can't get enough of it. And some baba ganoush, a little baba ganoush mixed in. Uh, it's really just uh, I've been having it every day that I come home um, from work lately, and, and and I like the rest of the menu. I want you to think about pricing out this, you know, um, wrap with um, falafel. Hummus, I know it's a little redundant, you know, um, and, and some beef shawarma uh, because, you know, I know your food is good, 
But if I also like it, it, I will be in there very regularly ordering something like that. So just price it out me so that when I order it, they'll know what to what to charge me. So welcome to East Arlington. I live very close by. You can actually see my roof from your place. So thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Mr. Ben. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, so Tony, um, there's a long tradition held by a, a former select board member from a uh, name, Kevin Greeley, who says, Welcome to Arlington. Thank you for choosing our town. Did you bring any samples? And uh, <laughs> I am reminded of that as I was reminded earlier uh, from an er our, our water sewer rate that we all managed to make it to that discussion while saying debt shift correctly, which is another uh, realism of significant difficulty. But all joking aside, Tony, thank you for choosing Arlington. Welcome. Very glad to have you. Mrs. Mahan? I'll, I'll say ditto to my colleagues' remarks. And um, as far as the jalapeno hummus, uh, my grandsons are half Nepalese. And I'm amazed that they're two of them at th ages three plus, and they're all about the jalapeno and the hummus. So um, I look forward to uh, your menu. And, and as Mr. Dunn said, and my other colleagues, you know, thank you for choosing Arlington. We wish you nothing but success. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, I've never tried jalapeno hummus, but it sounds good. And I'll always try anything once. So I look forward to coming in there and checking out your, your new location once you're finished. And with that, we have a motion to approve by Mr. DeCourcy, second by Mr. Diggins. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Kuma. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Yep. And that brings us to item number six on the agenda, traffic rules and order and other business for discussion and approval, Metro Fire Mutual Aid Agreement. Mr. Chaplin. Mr. Chair, I'm actually gonna ask uh, Attorney Heim to give a brief description and then I'll assist in answering any questions the board might have. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what you have before you is a renewal of our um, longstanding uh, mutual aid agreement with the fire department. Uh, the uh, nature of the agreement is, is relatively self-explanatory. Under chapter 48, section 59A, uh, a select board is supposed to approve the mutual aid agreement. It's a little bit uh, fuzzy under our town manager act. The town manager tends to sign and execute most of our mutual aid agreements uh, because he's authorized to, do, to enter into contracts and agreements on behalf of the town. So this is a little bit of an opportunity to A, discuss um, one of the uh, board and manager's shared goals of ensuring um, cooperation and mutual aid with other communities. But it's also an important um, uh, approval to just sort of make sure that we've dotted I's and crossed T's and given the manager the authority that we want to make sure he has for such an important uh, contract. Are there any questions substantively? This agreement has more or less been hammered out between all of the uh, chiefs in the, um, in the, in the, in the agreement. Uh, so it's kind of hard to make substantive changes. We can bring it back, but um, hopefully the board is satisfied with what's been constructed and we'll approve it as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Um, move approval. No comment. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? I'll, I'll second Mr. Dunn's um, approval. And just two quick questions, I hope. Um, uh, under this mutual aid agreement, does this now bring up our conglomeration of participating cities and towns to approximately 35? Or am I reading that wrong? I have to apologize. I did not do a count on it. Um, it's 35. Yeah, I, be I believe that is the right number. It is 35. Okay, and then um, just last two questions. Um, just where we're bringing this on and I, I'm anticipating, and in terms of liability, um, when any city or town is participating in mutual aid, if uh, in Arlington, uh, it, uh, 
town employee is um, suffers any kind of injury or anything that would result um, in the liability uh, in another city or town or vice versa, somebody is responding to an Arlington response um, and suffers some sort of injury, whether personal or, or vehicular or something else, how does that work out? Just really short term answer. Yeah. So uh, thank, thank you, that's an excellent question, uh, Mr. Bahan. Under uh, section three, uh, part B, it, it outlines that essentially um, the municipality rendering aid is responsible for operation of its equipment and um, basically remains subject to limits of liability. We all sort of essentially absorb uh, liability for our folks in rendering aid because we all benefit from the um, sort of equal provision of, of these services. So uh, our firefighters are taken care of. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, they're taken care of by Arlington. Um, but the same thing is true if somebody comes uh, to the aid of Arlington and somebody else's firefighters are hurt, uh, they're taken care of by uh, their respective municipality. Okay, and my last quick question would be, um, in light of uh, Arlington's small, short-lived, successful um, COVID-19 vaccine um, program down at the Arlington High School through the Board of Health and others, including the town manager secretary, um, is there any relief through this now 35 city and town um, mutual aid agreement that I know the governor stopped Arlington individually as uh, being able to give out the COVID vaccine that um, somehow we could join with the, the other 34 communities to become a collaboration that can do 750 vaccines a day or is that just, I'm, I'm reaching? That's another really good question. I actually think that our mutual aid agreement with respect to health services and a uh, agreement that we run um, for basically a uh, our, I believe it's, is it MEMA, uh, Mr. Chapdelain? Um, yes, it is MEMA. Might, might be better, uh, better equipped to service for some of those leverage points. Uh, it's, it's a great question. I, I don't think the, the, our, our, our fire uh, departments would do it, but it is possible that we have um, some uh, resources through our mutual aid partners in health and uh, emergency management that might have better occasion uh, or, or jurisdiction, if you will, for, for that kind of purpose. Does that make sense, Mr. Chaplain? Do you, would you concur well, with that? It, it does make sense, but I, I would add even further that we are part of a group that's a smaller subset of, uh, I think, communities in that are entirely included on that list, uh, also working with the Cambridge Health Alliance and Tufts University to submit a request for approval from the state for a regional vaccination clinic. They've, they haven't said no yet, but they haven't said yes yet either. Um, my suspicion is they're not going to start approving any more regional startups until vaccine supply increases, which could be, you know, in the next two to three weeks. So I, I'm still hopeful that they will once again let us start to do vaccination locally, but uh, it, it's still a waiting game right now. I guess my final comment question would be to the town manager. I know um, Rich McKinnon, who's a uh, president of the firefighters, um, professional firefighters here in Massachusetts. He and his union met with the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary, Mary Lou Sutters today to talk about um, having firefighters in different cities and towns. And um, some of the larger ones are contained in this 35 now, if this is approved city and town consortium. If we could follow up on that because um, Rich McKinnon, who I know and others do as well uh, in, in the uh, uh, PFFM and that, the, the, the fire union um, definitely have uh, the expertise as well as um, fire stations in our cities and towns that can do that. So I'd like, um, if it's appropriate to have um, our town manager, who's probably already on top of this, follow up on those conversations today that were had with Secretary Sutters, um, the way I was getting communications from Rich McKinnon. It seemed like this was a possibility versus, you know, pie in the sky. Um, and again, with this mutual aid um, fire department agreement, um, that would be something, again, it's just 
centered around teachers. I'd like to expand it if it's something that can happen, but it's uh, something that was discussed today. And I kind of feel like, you know, the first few cities and towns that uh, receive the information and get uh, there on the ground floor will be uh, more well uh, footed or suited to uh, take advantage of this program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, I support Mr. Dunn's motion. And I do note of the 35 communities, each one of our direct neighboring communities is part of the mutual aid agreement. So I, I think that's important. And uh, thank you for bringing this forward to us. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so I'm um, reading it, it mentioned that there was an operational plan appended onto the agreement. Uh, uh, did I miss that? I mean, I don't think it was attached. And that's okay if it wasn't. You know, I'm just kind of curious. Do you think there's anything worth that would be interesting to members of the board in reading that? Mr. I guess I didn't direct that to anyone. Um, I guess I should direct that to um, Mr. Heim. I'm sorry, Adam, if you wanted to speak on it, that's fine. I, I, I was going to say, I, I could ask Chief Kelly for that operational plan to share with the board. Um, my understanding is that it details the the tactical and operational planning that fire departments do to um, be able to uh, put their manpower together to respond to mutual aid requests. But I, I, I and I, I don't have immediate access to it, but I could certainly provide it. No, the, uh... I'd be getting it. I mean, my, my suspicion is that it probably wouldn't be of interest to, to the board. You know, it's just if I had missed it, then I was going to ask to um, be pointed to it. But if it wasn't included, I mean, it's probably for good reason. And, and I'm fine with that. Um, and and um, so the last agreement was in place for how long? Uh, I believe that the uh, last agreement was executed in November of 2001. Okay. Yeah, so, so roughly 20 years. Do you have a sense of, of um, how many times uh, we? contributed versus how many times we were helped? I don't have those statistics, though. I, right. I know it is very regularly on both sides of that yeah. coin. Uh, and, and most regularly, mutual aid manifests in providing backup to a community while that community's right. frontline gotcha. apparatus is responding. Right. So, right. I mean, I... If the chief were here, I would think he would say it maybe isn't is on a weekly basis where, you know, Somerville engines roll and we provide some backup there. The next night, Arlington engines roll and a Somerville engine provides backup, Lexington, you, you know, so yeah. on and so forth. So it actually fighting large fires uh, in mutual aid, I think, is much more rare because large fires are much more rare. Right. Right. But we certainly received mutual assist a uh, mutual aid um with that large garage fire on warren street the very large fire at arizona terrace a number of years ago um and i know we've also provided um we've also provided um mutual aid for large fires in neighboring communities so it is again it's more rare by by virtue of the fact that fires are more rare but but i think it you see the benefit of this mutual aid agreement on a, on a very regular basis with that backup being provided so it is, it is necessary and, and, and that, that's good. So I'm all for these regional um, approaches to things, as you know. So I'm happy to support it too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and my only comment that kind of goes along the lines with what Ms. Diggins was saying is that, I don't know if that's true, but I did speak with a firefighter one time about staffing and he had, had mentioned to me that anytime there's a fire in Arlington, every person, every firefighter that's on duty, no matter what station they're at, at the time has a role, to, some sort of role to play in that fire. And that's where we see the benefit of these agreements, where it's with one fire, we need somebody to be on on call for a second fire or a third fire. And, you know, it's good to see that we have this in place with our neighboring communities to make sure that that, that we are protected in those instances. So happy to support it. With that, we have a motion to approve by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Heim? Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, thank you. That takes us to our warrant article hearings, articles for review. 
first article that we have is Article 8, Bylaw Amendment K9, Control Fees and Fines. This is inserted the request of the town clerk. Ms. Chaplain, do you know who's speaking on this? Yep, Ms. Brazil is here. I just promoted yep. her. Ms. Brazil. Uh, hi, yes, I'm here. Um, good evening. So I know that um, this was presented last March. Um, I was in the room, March 9, the last hearing <laughs> in person. Um, and at the time, the clerk's office was recommending a uh, just a simple reduction in the fines. I agree with that. I think we should cut the fine um, in half. Um, we have a we have a harder time collecting a $50 fine for making a mistake, um, missing a deadline. Um, and it will be very much easier if, to enforce the rules if we can collect a $25 fine. Um, people argue about that a lot less. Um, so the, in addition though, in order to make this easier to understand and, and to enforce, I've uh, proposed some Simple changes um, just to clean up the language, clarify the language in the bylaw. Um, I've summarized it um, in a memo, but the critical talking points are that I want to be sure that it's clear in writing um, and a way that people can read it that all dogs have to be registered. Um, the deadline to register is January. Um, dogs, new dogs that move into town should register within 30 days of moving to town, puppies register when they're six months old. And I've worded the bylaw in such a way that I hope it's fairly clear that um, that those dates establish deadlines. And for each deadline, there's a 45 day grace period um, that runs and then that grace period runs out um, on the next Thursday at the end of the 45 days. Um, and we picked a Thursday, so because we're open except until 7 p.m. in the clerk's office. And we want to be sure we make it as easy as possible for people to make that very, very last deadline. Um, so, um, you know, you, if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I don't want to read an entire bylaw um, in this hearing. And Ms. Brazil, do you want to also present on Article 24 while we have you up here so we can get you in and out? Uh, sure. Yep. Yep. Uh, do you want me to do that now or do you want to ask questions about eight first? So you can present on article 24 as well that then the board can roll through any questions that they have on either. Okay, so um, article 24, um, uh, I've already um, talked to the finance committee um, and I'm pretty sure that they voted 14 to two um, to support it. Um, the uh, concept is I think we should, as a community, uh, go ahead and study when and how, if we want to uh, convert the clerk's office from an elected to appointed position. Uh, when I was a town meeting member, as a town meeting member, I'm still a town meeting member, I supported converting the treasurer's position. Um, I found it very helpful. There was a thoughtful process. Um, we didn't rush into it in any way. There was the DOR report, which gave us a sort of a roadmap. Pretty sure we created a couple of study groups internally that presented back. And I think we should follow a similar process and look at converting the clerk's office. Um, uh, I, I talked to the town manager and he thinks we could probably hire a consultant if we decide to do that um, for no more than $10,000. Um, so, um, you know, that's basically it. I think, the, you know, I certainly wanted to catch the select board up because um, although, you know, the finance committee gets to weigh in on the appropriations, there's a lot going on. Um, anytime we set up, um, you know, attempt to study, you know, something like this, um, the finance committee asked a couple questions whether um, we couldn't save the money and go ahead and set up an internal um, study group. And I'm certainly open to that. I think it's important. And a lot of towns um, hire outside consultants to bring in that fresh perspective. Um, they even bring in outside um, 
people to in, for the hiring committees. I mean, it, this is a this is an important um, thing that you're considering, um, and I and I want to be sure that we're doing it thoughtfully. And I um, so my recommendation is that we bring somebody in, but I'm happy, obviously, always to discuss it with you guys. All right, and I will go to the board for any questions, comments, or motions on Articles 8 and 24. Mr. Dunn? Um, I am very happy to support both. I, I think that the, the changes in the language in 8 are really straightforward. Um, I think that 24 is a, a good, I, I, I'm, I'm predisposed to think that we should move to an appointed clerk. But I also know that it's uh, something that's not taken lightly. And I think that uh, taking a closer look at it first makes sense. But I think that uh, the treasurer's office really benefited from having a, um, the, the, the treasurer's office really benefited from, from being a closer integrated to the rest of the town. I think the employees when the op within the office stopped being so siloed and got to interact with other departments a lot better and became a lot, opened up a lot of uh, cross, uh, like interdepartmental and cross departmental career advancement that I think is really uh, powerful for the town. And I think that we also benefit from, um, with the offices like that, I don't, I actually, I just don't think that the elections were serving it, they were always serving us that well, where sometimes we would get a really great treasurer and sometimes we weren't getting a great treasurer. And, uh, I certainly think that Julie's a great treasurer, but she's not going to be here for, oh, excuse me, Julie's a great town clerk, but she's not going to be here forever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll second Mr. Dunn's motion. I do have a, a few questions that may lead to, to a friendly amendment, but just on, on the annual re renewal, uh, Ms. Brazil, has January traditionally been the month for the renewals? Like you, and I know you're gonna. We want to put this in the bylaw now, but I'm just wondering if if that had been consistent over the years. I think it has. Um, it's because it's easier to print a dog tag with the year on it and have that be, you know. And then you can change the color, and obviously the the year printed on the tag itself changes so that it's visually obvious. Um, it's just easier to do it on a calendar year for the renewals. Okay, and, and I'm just going to suggest a change on, on paragraph two. I, I know you mm -hmm. say they must be renewed every January. I wonder if we can't put they must be renewed on or before January 31st of each of each year, just so that we we have a deadline. And, and it also leads to my next question on what the intention was on the grace period. Was it 45 days after January 31st or 45 days after January 1 when the obligation first arose? Pretty sure if you do the math, in March, 45 days from, so the deadline this year is March 11th. Okay, um, all right, so so it's, a, it's after the deadline rather than, I I, I just, on, on bylaws, just to make it, I, I almost prefer to put dates rather than, than, than the days, and I know the grace period ap applies both to the annual renewal right. and dogs moving into town, so I, 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 I get that, so. Um, I'm just wondering, and, and maybe Attorney Heim, again, this is more of a friendly amendment rather than maybe 45 days after each deadline, um, the grace period ends. Attorney Heim? Sorry about that. So um, the friendly amendment would be so that it reads failure to satisfy requirements before the third first Thursday following 45 business days to the date of relicensing. Is that the provision that you're talking about, Mr. DeCourcy? I'm sorry, just inserting language that it's the deadline, 45 business days after the, the respective deadline, mm -hmm. as opposed to the date the obligation arises. I, I, I'm sorry to get people bogged down on this, but I mean, I just feel like that that the way it's you're looking at January 31 as a deadline, you're going 45 days after that. And then during the mm -hmm. year, you're gonna have different deadlines depending on when families with dogs move into town. Sure, I, sure. I, I think, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. So Mr. DeCourcy, I, I think I can wordsmith something, but along the lines of, you know, uh, relevant deadlines set forth, you know, in sections, you know, um, 
yeah, set forth, set forth your in, or I'll figure out which sections it should explicitly reference. Okay, thank you. And and just one last thing, and and uh, on the waiver of fees, and this this seems to be a, a change, and I, I don't know if this is an enforcement type thing, but for the service animal, and for an owner age seventy or over, we're waiving the regular fees. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a little uncomfortable with charging them a late fee if they come in. I mean, obviously you want them to come in, but I, 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 I'd, I'd be more comfortable with there being no fee and and they, and they come in here unless I unless there's a, a strong reason for for charging a late fee for a for a yeah, for a license that we're not charging anything for. Um. No. Okay. Um. It's harder to enforce if you don't charge the twenty-five dollar fine from being really, really late. Um, I mean, we've, we've waived the fee um, forever and that's not, that's not, uh, I, I, I'm, I support that. Um, so I would be in favor, but obviously um, I'm of keeping uh, the fine um, for people who can't um, do the paperwork on time. I think Mrs. course would, the, the reason for the fine is and the clerk can correct me if I'm wrong, is to incentivize people because they want their dogs to be licensed, correct? So, so without the fine, they just wouldn't license their dogs. Yeah, I, 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 I get that for the people who are paying the annual fee, but for the people that an elderly person or a person who has a service dog, where we're not charging the fee, I, and I understand you know, maybe no one comes in at that point, but it's, um, I, I just, it, it, it sounds like the rest of the board doesn't really want to do anything on that. I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but that's, um, I'll, I'll just leave that out there. I mean, the bylaw as it stands now, we charge them the full $50 fine. Um, so, um, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, although I thought late fees apply is new language for both the um, service animal and owner age 70 and over category. I wanted it to be clear. Okay. We do, we do charge it. Okay. But I wanted it to be clear. All right, and, and just briefly, Mr. Chairman, on Article 24, I support that. Um, and, I, and I understand the primary motion will be the Finance Committee's motion on this because it will, will require an appropriation. Um, just a question on who, who will the con consultant report to uh, with the, 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 the final work product or who will be presented to? So that's one of the reasons for talking um, to you tonight. Um, I think we do, uh, you know, as a collective team, uh, we will need to to think about that. Um, uh, I think each, I think each town sets it up the way that's comfortable and makes sense for them. Um, so I'm I'm open um, to suggestions about how we how we structure that. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Attorney Heim, did you have something to add there? No. Yeah, I, I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I think what what I would recommend as a default, unless the board is uncomfortable with it, is that you know, as the chief executive body, um, regardless of whether or not the board opts to take a position, it would seem like the most natural fit for the board to receive the report. Um, much in the way that the board was was one of the places where the treasurer office conversion was discussed. It wasn't necessarily true that all members of the board supported conversion, but it seems like the best place since the, the treasurer, I mean, oh my gosh, the clerk doesn't have regular public meetings of some kind. The election modernization committee would be the other uh, possibility, um, of course, since this is, um, you know, an established body that looks at um, some of the issues that influence the town clerk. But, but ultimately I think the select board would have to be, would, would have to report on the conversion issue at some point or another, um, even if it's you know only in the town meeting season under a one article, I think it would still have to come before the board eventually. Yep. All right, Mrs. Mahan. I was just saying, what's the odds that I get a call on next? Um, easy, easy thing for our article eight. Um, I'm definitely in support of, have no questions. Um, 
thank you to my colleagues for sort of mulling that out. Um, article 24, um, I'm not in favor of. And, and, and the reason I say that, especially with the town clerk and having gone through the town treasurer experience um, for years, I oppose that. Um, and the only reason I um, acquiesced to it was that A, Dean Carmen was coming in and B, there were representations from uh, town administration, school administration, and my colleagues on the school side that um, with this, uh, taking this position away from the voters to be appointed uh, by the town manager, that there would be a um, agreement uh, between town and school that the treasurer along with um, the deputy town manager, vis-a-vis -vis town manager, would um, work with the school side to uh, ensure that there was um, duplicity in terms of general accounting ledger of how the, the town budget and school budget um, operates in terms of transparency and reporting and basic general ledger 101, and that did not happen. It fell to the politics again. Um, my opinion, schools were given a pass. Don't get me started on special ed. Don't get me started on long range planning um, meetings that we've had, uh, which Mr. DeCourcy chairs. Um, and there have been some uh, very open and transparent conversations from the town side and on the school side, it's just been, in my personal opinion, not speaking for Mr. DeCourcy or anyone else on that committee, School side is just totally, again, a wall. Um, and unfortunately politics played into that and it played out. So I wish I hadn't dropped my stance on treasure um, because the promises that were made did not come true. And so my concern on the town clerk, which I will not be voting for. So if we can take two separate votes, if that's okay with Mr. Dunn and Mr. DeCourcy, yeah. um, will not be in favor of that. Um, we are a town, if we wanna move to a city, and give everything to the city manager to appoint, then someone should embark on a charter commission, but especially around the town clerk. I, I know one, one of my colleagues said, you know, thank goodness we have Ms. Brazil, uh, but we might not have her in the future, but um, unless someone can point to a previous town clerk um, that was a disaster um, throughout her whole uh, tenancy, not accounting for maybe a few months, um, that uh, that process has worked. And I don't think politics should get involved with the town clerk's office because I've seen nothing good come of it. I'm so disappointed, um, not by Ms. Mrs. Ms. Martin, Mrs. Martin. Um, she's a great treasurer, but um, the reason we went down that path, which is kind of what I'm hearing here, we wanna do the right thing and make sure it's fair. Um, I, I, I don't think it's the right way to go. So I will vote yes on eight and no on article 24 and I think it's a waste of money and thus the town clerk's office wants to take a study amongst itself that doesn't cost any money but it doesn't sound like that so uh, that, that's my position thank you mr. chair um, so with respect to aid I mean I understand where um, Mrs. Corsi is coming from about uh, putting a fine, I me mean, when there's no charge, but I definitely agree with Ms. Brazil, I mean, that you do need to have an incentive made uh, for people to to um, do the registration. So so they get the break, I me mean, by not having to pay for it. But if they don't do it, I mean, there really needs to be some incentive. So I'm in favor of keeping the fine on that one. Uh, with respect to 24, you know, I understand the, how treasurer is kind of different than clerk because clerk runs the elections. I mean, so we do have to be careful about that. When I think about where we are more likely to end up being with a uh, ineffective or let's rephrase that, uh, a bad clerk, I, mean, um, I have my opinions on that, but this isn't the time for it uh, because I am all in favor of studying the issue you know, because we, when, uh, when it's studied, it may come back to us that because we are a town, uh, it may not be a good idea I mean, to, to um, appoint one. Uh, we may get arguments for it. So, so I'm all for the study. I mean, with respect to who does it, uh, I think it's probably better to have an outside 
party do it once again because it is an elected position and we do want to have I me mean, at least the, the semblance of neutrality normally i'm all for having it done internally because i like to have those skill sets or build those skill sets inside but this would be one case for going um outside so so like i said i have my my um my thoughts about whether it should but like i said it's, this isn't a place for it so um you'll see how i'm gonna vote when i vote yeah Thank you. Yep. And I think everything in Article 8 makes sense. It made sense before and it still does. Um, and Article 24, you know, similar to what Mr. Dickens said, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any harm in the study. I wouldn't take a position at this time as, as to whether or not it should be appointed versus elected. But you know, I think if we can present, you know, options as to what it would, the conversion would look like and how it would be structured, I think it helps make the decision. And, it might, like you said, make it look like maybe we don't want that structure. Maybe we do, but I think at least knowing what we're in for is a good thing. So this is a public hearing. So if any members of the public would like to speak on either Article 8 or Article 24, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom application now. All right, and with that, we will close public comment and attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve article eight. Just so I can clarify, um, this article eight is with the uh, friendly amendment with respect to the articulation of deadlines. Is that correct? Correct, Mr. Carson or Mr. Dunn. Yes, happy to. Okay, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. We have a motion to approve Article Twenty Four, Attorney Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. In light of the 2023 $18 million possible override, and we need to trim, I say no. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. In the light of the fact that this is about the town clerk's office and not the schools, I vote yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Okay, it is a four to one vote. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Brazil. Thank you. All right. Article 9, bylaw amendment display of notice fines. Ms. Chaplin. Mr. Chaplin, do you want me to? Yeah, please, please, Mr. Hines. Attorney Hines. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is very, very quick. Uh, this is basically a cleanup uh, to a previous revision to the bylaws where uh, we updated the, uh, the last time we updated um, the sign bylaws because we removed its association with the outdoor advertising um, general law provisions, uh, we could not assess as high of a penalty. And the attorney general's office essentially says the, the penalty has to be $300 instead of $500. So that's the crux of it. Thank you. All right, Ms. Dickens. Oh, that's an easy one for me. I'll move positive action. I have nothing to add to it. Thank you. Mr. Corson. Second. Mr. Dunn. No comment, thank you. Ms. Mon? Since it has nothing to do with the schools, no comment, thank you. Okay. This is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application. Not anticipating any public comment on this one. We'll close public comments. Attorney Heim? We have a motion for positive action. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Diggins. That's okay, that's quite all right, yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's uh, unanimous vote, thank you. All right, that takes us to Article 10, Bylaw Amendment Street Performance Definition. Mr. Ch Chapman. Mr. Hurd, if you, I'm happy to handle it. Uh, this has been requested to be polled, to my understanding. So, 
there's a motion for no action if the board, unless the board would like to take up the issue again. Sure. Mrs. DeCorsa? Yeah, I'll move no action. Ms. Niggins? I'll second that. Ms. Nunn? No comment. Ms. Mahan? No comment, thank you. And this is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak on this, use the raise hand function in your Zoom application now. A wonderful way to conduct warrant article hearings. Attorney Hyam, we have a motion for a no action. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, that takes us to Article 17, Vote Establishment of a Youth, youth and Young Adult Advisory Board Commission or Committee Study Committee. Ms. Diggins, do you want to take this one? Yeah, thank you. I mean, so um, as um, you all may know, I mean, I ran I mean, on the notion of creating something like this. I mean, and I, I think given the hard time that we gave people who came to the board with the resolutions that we felt, well, you know, I mean, why do we need to do this? I mean, why can't I me? Mean, why do we need to have this resolution when we can? We have the means to do this. I mean, and uh, yes, the select board could create one. I could ask you all to um, create one, and if everyone or most of us agreed to it, uh, we would. I mean, but I don't. I feel it would be better if something like this were not a. Um, if it didn't continue because of the makeup of the board. And uh, I want it to have a life of its own. I, mean, I also want town meeting to own it, you know, because I think a, a, the the youth and young adult a, are part of the entire community. And I think the creation of something like this should uh, be done by the entire community. Uh, and the reason for studying it as opposed to wanting to create it right away uh, was uh, I did some work for the Rainbow Commission and, and that led me to check out all 351 websites to me you know, the municipalities and in towns and I did see some interesting takes being you know, on this concept I mean and so I, I would like to see us explore that um, uh, more intensely and and also uh, I tend to be the deliberative type I mean, so I and, and the collaborative type I mean, so I would like to have a, a bunch of uh, people in the room the virtual room uh, discussing this and the better the best part about that too is that it would be open to the public so regardless of the makeup of the study committee I mean, it would be open for lots more input I mean, from the community uh, so so that's my rationale for asking for the study committee so uh, any questions, comments? Um, I turn it back over to the chair. Can you move approval or wait for other board members? I don't, is it right for me to move approval of my own? I, I think, yeah. I can, okay, yes, yes, so I, I, I move approval of it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'm happy to second it. Um, I read it and I gave it, uh, and I, I, I think it's an interesting study. My one thought, and I'm curious what other um, board members think, is that we should cons we should I think we should find a way to make sure that we're getting uh, some diversity, equity, inclusion uh, voice on this group. To, and so I'm not exactly sure what the best way to do that is. Um, one option might be to actually even to move the seat from the LBGDQ to something more broad, or maybe to add another seat. And I don't know if it makes sense to maybe add um, someone from the Black Students Union or like, like a designee from the high school, or if there is um, maybe another, uh, oh shoot, I forget, uh, someone from um, the, uh, I, I forget, I know the, the, the title of the woman um, who changed the diversity, it was diversity coordinator, but I think it, her title changed and I don't remember. The it's still D DEI director. DEI director, thank you. I, apolog I, I apologize for, not recalling the appropriate title, um, but anyway, I, I think that the, I think that the committee could be improved through that through an addition of that type. But but in general, I, I'm very supportive. Yeah, Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also support the motion by Mr. Diggins, and um, perhaps for the 
final vote so that there can be something worked on uh, to to address Mr. Uh, Dunn's suggestions, which I think are, are very good. Mrs. Mahan. Um, ditto Mr. DeCourcy's comments. All right, and I'll support as well. You know, I think it's an innovative idea and we'll, I'm excited to see what we can come up with. All right, this is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak on this item, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom application now. All right, that closes public hearing. Attorney Hyman, we have a motion to approve. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Uh, can I um, propose, uh, I, was, I was wondering if we we're gonna get any voices from the crowd that gave that saw a path. Uh, I would like to propose a friendly amendment to Mr. Diggins' motion uh, that it includes uh, the, 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 the draft that we see next, like for, for final approval, includes some form of a DEI representative. And I leave that to um, Mr. Diggins and the, and the chair and the town council to, to fit into the draft. All right, Mr. Diggins? Yeah, I, yeah I, I fully support that. I mean, and I certainly have some ideas about how to do that. Yeah, and, and I also want to emphasize me that that of the, the, the study committee itself I mean, does not have the diversity I mean that the the committee it's commission or board whatever um, results will have the whole purpose will be to study how to get that you know and so so um so yeah um very happy to support that amendment can i ask for a clarification of one thing mr chair yes so are we um is the amendment to create a new an additional member um Specifically, um, my I, I didn't want to bind you in that tightly, Doug. If you find a way to figure it out without adding a member, do it. And if you want to add a member and it solves it, do it. That would be got it. All right, Attorney Hunt. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Right. Brings us to Article 19, vote establishment of a town committee on residential development. We have Mr. Parisi with us. Mr. Priest, can you hear us? Yes, I got to turn everything on. Okay, there we go. Say your name. Can you, can you see me and hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I, uh, this statement and this warrant article was presented last year, and it's a carryover because of the delay. So thereby, there's a statement that I made last year that's in the reference material. Uh, it's not too long and explains uh, the basis and summary of uh, this Warren article pretty well. So as such, I'm going to just try to be very brief and hit the highlights here. And if you have any questions and so forth, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Uh, I'm certainly a longtime resident of Arlington. And so I've been watching the residential development that goes on here uh, over the last five or 10 years. And I'm trying to address some of the concerns that residents have that perhaps have not been addressed yet and don't seem to be coming up on anyone's agenda. Um, some of these issues were raised as far back as 2016 at town meetings and at various board uh, 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 meetings, including the ARB meetings. Um, and it would be good if we are able to look at this from the viewpoint of existing residents and the impacts of development on their neighborhoods and their quality of life. Well, we have largely had very positive development throughout towns in all the zoning districts. Uh, from time to time, because of such an increased activity, some things are not coming out probably as well as existing residents may wish, and they may have some negative impacts on these people. So, uh, last year, I had drafted this and 
The idea is to get a resident majority committee of residents that are not affiliated with the town or its governance and not affiliated with the um, building and development and real estate industries uh, so that we could periodically meet, raise concerns, identify issues of concern and bring them up to the appropriate boards in town. Um, essentially a way to elevate some of these issues. Now, one of the things that had gone forward as a result of town meeting was a good neighbor agreement, but its implementation is still kind of spotty from what I understand and remains an issue. Quality of life issues uh, certainly remain when developments are inappropriate in a neighborhood such as loss of sunlight, loss of sight lines, loss of privacy, and all of these kinds of things are actually exasperated much more on areas and it, it, that are abutting uh, non-conforming lots. Where a non-conforming abutter exists, uh, these um, negative or potential negative effects are greatly exaggerated. And I've heard no discussion about non-conforming lots and how they fit into all the development plans in the town. Um, especially when we have uh, significant uh, issues going on. Um, some of the other issues that were mentioned were certainly environmental and public health impacts that need to always be elevated. Um, for instance, rock removal, excavation, noise, and debris that's generated on construction sites. So very briefly, no one group seems to represent just the residents in town. And these issues, uh, some, way, some ways always getting submerged or uh, less, less um, uh, visibility than they should. <clears throat> so that's a very brief overview of the issues. And uh, we're back again because COVID didn't allow us to fully address this last year at town meeting. And hopefully it can get addressed here. So. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have, and that's about it. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know that I have a question, um, or if it is a question, but I'm, I'm still unsure with this committee. It's no less than five, no more than nine. Um, the membership speaks to a quorum that's appointed. Um, so I don't know if that means five are appointed by the town moderator. I'm not sure where the other four come from. And um, I do know that, you know, the redevelopment board and planning board are the boards that um, if anything were to come from this committee would um, have the authority to present to town meeting. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of that. Some other board of commission isn't setting up a, um, you know, uh, we don't feel we have enough time with the select board or, or unheard enough or something else. So we're gonna set up a study group that we're not doing the same thing to our colleagues um, on the redevelopment and planning board. So um, I guess my question, two questions to Mr. Paris, and then from that, maybe mm -hmm. a comment or question after that. Is it five or nine members? Um, five are appointed. Where do we get the other four? And it seems as though, with all due respect, that um, the option of um, residents uh, organized or not going before the planning department or redevelopment board just don't want to do this anymore and want to set up a committee? Um, as, far, as far as the five to nine, I had written it with my minimal understanding of town procedures and so forth that the town moderator could appoint all of the members. The difference was we were specifying that at least five would be residents with no affiliations as I briefly discussed before, so that we would be getting resident opinions strictly based on their experiences as town residents and living in the neighborhoods and experiencing what's going on. 
Uh, the other four certainly could have some affiliations with the town and so forth, um, but it'd be a resident oriented committee. If there's a better way to structure it, I'm certainly open to that. If there's a better way to get residents together to get these opinions in a more formal manner and then be able to forward them to the town, I'm open to that. The object of this is to try to take into account the variety of things that are going on in neighborhoods that may not always be visible, but many residents are concerned about. Okay, did thank I, you. Did I miss your second question? Uh, no, no. Um, it was, I think I already know about the, perhaps your feelings of um, using the route of the planning to board, planning board and redevelopment uh, authority meetings, which is where I think this should be properly addressed as well as we have a, an exemplary tree warden uh, regarding the tree canopy issues. So um, I guess I'll wait to hear from my colleagues. This is something I am just not inclined to support because it's just not defined well enough for me uh, as well as um, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Therese for bringing this forward. I, I, I do share Mrs. Mahan's concerns um, in terms of, I, I agree this, these issues I think are more properly before the redevelopment board. And, and I think it's important to raise the issues, but I'm, I'm hesitant to support the creation of a, a, a committee at this point. Mrs. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, my inclination would be that you maybe need to work on figuring out what the committee will do, um, how it will be structured, and especially how you can get a, a, a wide array in, of, of um, residents so that a, you don't end up a, with a very small group of people who think the same way. A, so, so I can, look, a, I am, um, Part of the reason I went the route was with my request being um, uh, for setting up a, a study committee I mean, for using young adults was to figure out how to do this. You know, um, and and I think you could maybe stand to have I me mean, some time to figure out how to do it. I mean, and 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 if you aren't willing to change it to a committee to study how to do this, I mean, then maybe spend I mean, some more time working with. Um, people who care about these issues too. I mean, I, and I care, I mean, I'm a little concerned about the bandwidth that I have, uh, but I, mean, I, I would certainly, you know, I mean, I'm interested I mean, in trying to figure out how to approach this. I and mean, even if um, we don't decide to do positive action on this or we don't amend it to a study committee, you know, so uh, that's where I'm, I'm leaning um, towards maybe doing a study committee on how to do it, but I'll, I'll wait too before I'm chiming in on how I'm going to vote. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Parisi, for bringing it forward. I do appreciate the discussion because I think one of the th points that you make that comes through loud and clear is that there are, um, there's definitely a, a several, many people in the town who aren't satisfied with the progress on our revisions to our zoning bylaws. Um, and the, but I, and I actually think that that, but I, I think that one of the things that I, I guess I, I hear is that, uh, not specifically from you, but I, I know from other conversations that, um, some people think we aren't going, you know, there's a lot of disagreement on which direction we should be going, let alone how fast we should be going. Yeah. And, uh, I, unfortunately, I, I, I continue to believe that these discussions are best held within the committees that we already have meaning um, the, the ARB, the Zoning Bylaw Review, and so on. And I don't think that creating an additional committee will um, provide us any additional clarity or help <laughs> us move forward with any additional uh, velocity. So uh, I'm, I, well, I, I greatly appreciate the conversation. I greatly appreciate you bringing it forward. I'm going to respectfully um, move a recommendation of no action. All right. And again, thank you, Mr. Parisi for the presentation, mm -hmm. I don't want to reiterate what all my colleagues have said, other than, you know, this is a discussion that I think starts in and around the redevelopment board, since they're the board that has the authority over the zoning changes. 
So I think, you know, this is certainly a, an issue that we hear often and people are concerned about, but I think there's other avenues within the, I think residents have other avenues to voice their concerns and try to push for changes in these areas as currently structured. Um, so we do have a motion for no action. Do we have a second before we turn to public comment? Second. Mr. Jacorsi, this is a public hearing. If any members of the public wish to speak to this article, we have one raised hand. Mr. Chaplain, you can promote Winnell Evans. All right. Ms. Evans, if you can just say your name for the record. There we go. Can you hear me now? Winnell Evans, Orchard Place. Yes, we can. Um, I, I would like to speak in support of this article. I, I hear and understand the concerns that people have about how this would be structured and what the specific purposes might be, but I do believe there's a need for it. Um, to my understanding, there is not currently a committee or a board that would address the kind of issues that Mr. Paris is talking about. Um, to my understanding, the ZBA is really more of a reactive board. They deal with issues having to do with specific properties that come before them, but they are not proactively um, designing bylaws or, or other kinds of actions that would deal with some of these issues. And the ARB is dealing with um, somewhat larger scale projects. And I think what Mr. Parisi is talking about are individual instances in neighborhoods. Um, very briefly, I was a member of the residential study group and when it was disbanded, we had um, several items on our docket that we didn't get to and that really have not had the kind of follow-up that they deserve. The issue of rock removal is going to only become more and more of an issue because basically the, you know, the level easy lots are gone. And, and when redevelopment takes place now, the likelihood that it will be on lots that require significant rock removal is, is only growing. Um, we had planned to do a follow-up of enforcement on the good neighbor agreement to see how residents' ideas and reactions to development had changed after it had been in place for a while, and we did not um, have an opportunity to do that. We uh, were definitely going to talk about the potential impacts of um, accessory dwelling units on abutters. That will probably be handled through the, the redevelopment board. Um, but I think the perennial issue that comes up is that of teardowns. And this began uh, in, in my memory with Lynn Cardin's 2016 um, uh, moratorium. There is now another moratorium uh, article proposed. And there, there's obviously something that is not being addressed in terms of how people feel about what's going on in their neighborhoods. They see these smaller, older homes demolished and replaced with much larger and much more expensive homes. So there, there are ripple effects from what's going on here. So I think a study group to, to talk about what's happening in neighborhoods, how it impacts abutters and, and other neighbors, um, and to think about maybe how we can address what people see as, as these issues. Um, there are an awful lot of incredibly smart people in Arlington. I am humbled every time I attend a, a committee or a board meeting. And I think a group of residents could get together and maybe do um, a much better job than I'm doing right now about really delineating the issue and thinking about ways to address it. Thank you for letting me speak. All right, and we have Ms. Henkin. Hi, Anna Hankin, Precinct 6. Um, I wanted to speak against this. This seems like a formalization of a lot of like homeowners association, NIMBY kind of things that I worry would simply try to further push affordable housing out of Arlington. Um, I feel like this is, if you have problems in your neighborhood, the important 
people to be talking to should be your town meeting member, should be members of the redevelopment board. Um, I just don't think that a handful of people who are, who just want their area to look slightly nicer is really an important thing for the town to have. I think that this is something that de-democratizes getting information about what housing and residential needs are in the town. Yeah, that's really all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we had a hand, which has now gone down. So that will close the public comment portion of this article. All right. Without any additional comments, we have a motion for no action by Mr. Dunn, second by Mr. Corsi. Attorney Hine. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeze. Thank you. The next article that we have is Article 23, Vote Provision of Town Email Addresses for Town Meeting Members. We have Ms. Hankin up again. Hi, <laughs> nice to see you all again. Um, so my warrant article 23 is meant to mandate that the town provide official town email addresses for each town meeting member as their primary form of contact. The intent is that this email address would provide town meeting members with addresses that are easy to reach, don't expose their personal email addresses to malicious actors, and improve transparency overall in the town. Um, it's a fairly simple ask, but it addresses a lot of kind of complex problems that occur in trying to communicate with town government in Arlington. Um, official town email addresses make it a lot easier for constituents to contact town meeting members and better communication makes for better town government. Um, having an official email address would provide a smooth standardized and reliable method of contact. And a lot of town member meeting, town meeting member emails currently aren't listed or go to defunct inboxes. Having all of the incoming contact go through an official town email provides accountability and transparency, which improves trust between the community and the town government. Um, emails that come into an official town email are discoverable by an FOIA request, and this is a positive thing. It represents a commitment to the integrity of our town governance. Um, in fact, a town meeting member who couldn't be here tonight was is so adamant about this point that he actually sent me a quote that he wanted me to read in support of it. Um, Adam McNeil, the town meeting member from Precinct 4, um, he said that good constituent engagement and therefore complete fulfillment of the spirit of representative's office requires active work and effort. This is especially true at the town meeting level where formal polling doesn't exist and issues usually have a very high impact on daily life to general populace excitement ratio. Um, however, we're lucky to have constituents that occasionally initiate engagement and valuable feedback, thoughts, and information, but we should work to make this so-called easy part of constituent engagement as low a hurdle as possible for the engager. Obviously, the town can't mandate that a town meeting member actively check their inboxes, just like they can't mandate that they vote at town meeting in the first place, but supplying the inboxes is an easy way to provide a tool for engagement and facilitate a culture of constituent engagement. Um, providing town emails rather than personal emails is much safer for town meeting members and adds an additional barrier to both harassment and spam. Um, protecting the privacy of town meeting members is important. You shouldn't have to expose yourself to online harassment or privacy breaches to serve in town government. Um, the town IT infrastructure is much more capable than individual town meeting members to protect against phishing scams, spam, and other malicious actors. Having your personal email attached to identifying information like your street address and your name are, won't immediately allow identity theft, but the more pieces of personal identifying information you have together, especially because a lot of those personal emails are what people then use to log into a lot of their online accounts. 
increases their chance of having a privacy breach. Um, and it also allows many of them to be contacted by online trolls and be the subject of harassment. Um, and if your work in local government earns you the attention of these online harassers, it's a lot harder to close off your personal email, which is connected to a lot of other accounts to avoid them than it is for the town IP to move you to another official address, especially when we're moving on from the position and retiring. Um, the article only mandates that these email addresses be the primary listed contact by the town in place of the current emails. The law doesn't allow us to mandate, and this article doesn't dictate, that town meeting members use this as for all town member-related business, simply that the town provides it as the primary contact. It's easy to therefore answer incoming emails from what our inbox works best via mail forwarding. And that also allows for town meeting members who can't or do not want to use email at all to set up what is basically used for a lot of out of office emails where it just bounces back and it can send someone a phone number and hours to call if that's how they wanna be contacted. Um, this should all be in line with the town's acceptable use policy for their email. Um, having a provided separate inbox makes it easier to find town business related emails rather than searching one's own personal inbox, especially around the time of town meeting when you're getting a lot of notifications from the town, from other town meeting members, and from your constituents. Um, that just makes it a lot easier to know <laughs> where your stuff is and to make sure you're not missing important emails regarding the town. Um, adding users to an already existing email system is a fairly straightforward and not outrageously expensive endeavor. Um, it's the kind of thing that the high school has to do every year when they get a new crop of freshmen. Um, I talked to Sandy Pooler and the cost per user for the Microsoft governmental email license that the town uses is $90 per user per year, resulting in a total cost of about $22,000 a year for all 252 town meeting members. However, several town meeting members actually have and have listed their town emails as their main contact information, which would not add to the cost or workload of onboarding. Um, it's not a super outrageous cost to the town. There's no listed specific line item in the publicly available town financials for the sum total of the town's email hosting. Um, but from looking at the expenses under the IT department, $22,000 represents less than 4% of the current half million expenses listed under the IT department and we give town meeting, which doesn't have any expenses currently listed, expenses on par with those listed for the select board, which is also around $22,000. Um, it's a really worthwhile expense to increase the effectiveness of communication and improve privacy for, and security for town meeting members. Um, sending inquiries from these official emails will also make it easier for other town offices to recognize and prioritize town meeting members um, who often serve on committees, other volunteer positions, or are carrying messages from their constituents to those town offices. Um, it just makes the operation- You can just wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, I just have another- And question. you probably have a couple of questions on the board. Town government isn't just a hobby. You and the town meeting members do important work that impacts the lives and livelihoods of the people who live in this town. The choices that are voted on in town meeting are a really great responsibility. And it's important that we don't just support that on kind of a personal level, but logistically and systematically. It's important that constituents can reach town meeting members in a reliable official capacity and that town meeting members have a reliable, safe way to be contacted. Um, it also reduces work for the town clerk when compiling contact information, which is an extra bonus. Thank you. And I will turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Dunn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Hankin, for the presentation that you definitely covered uh, quite a bit in there. One of the things um, I'm curious, did, did your exploration take you into uh, tech support about what the, what, how, like, estimates about that and what the, what that would look like? Um, I tried to get an estimate from the IP department. Um, they said that they don't entirely know what tech support would look like. And there's no, unfortunately, there's no line item in the publicly available financials on the town website. 
for tech support and how much it generally costs for other departments that exist. Yeah. Um, but adding users is probably the work of a week or two. Um, I get, so my thought, um, it's an interesting idea, and I had, and I, I, and I, I was, I was, I was thinking it over a little bit, and I guess one of my concerns is the, is that tech support aspect of it, because so, like the goals you've got about the, about increased participation, increased ac accessibility, I certainly am in favor of those. I'm, I definitely have some concerns that that putting the email addresses up there, as you as you definitely pointed out, is different from someone actually reading them and responding to them. And uh, it's been my experience that so that a lot of the town meeting members aren't always the most technolo technologically savvy. They you know there's a there's a very there's a high variation in the technical skills uh, of town meeting members. And uh, I thought and I thought about the high school example. And uh, like it exists, those, you know, that freshman class of high school, they are di they're digital natives, and for them, a login and a password is, you know, they've had they've literally had them since they were born. Uh, whereas a bunch of our, I can think of at least um, one town meeting member who I correspond with, whose email address they're both town meeting members, but they share their, the, it's a married couple that shares the same email address, and uh, that you know, like figuring through all the accommodations for things like that is a it's a, it's like, it's a, it's, there, there's definitely administrative overhead. So you, you, yeah. there's kind of, you talked about a savings for the town clerk, but there's, a, there's a lot more on, on the other side. Um, th thank you for answering my question. Uh, I'm going to keep listening for a bit before I come to a, a, a final thought. All right. And Mrs. Mahan. I was hoping I'd be last on this. Um, when we had the great town email debate for uh, members of the select board. Um, I voted in, I think I was the only person who voted no. Um, but of course, when it went through, um, I agreed to have the town email. For four years, I got nothing. Um, wasn't able to access it because everything came through as spam. Um, and then uh, the fifth year uh, that we remedied, but then um, one of my concerns was that uh, my town email, I would not be the person overseeing it and controlling it. Uh, it would be taken out of my hands and I was told I shouldn't worry about that. Well, what happened was uh, through my town email, uh, the town was contacted and I know the town manager is aware of this and the select board's office that an email came in to um, stop my direct deposits of $111.63 a month as my payment for being a member of the select board and um, to stop the direct mail and to send it to a different. And uh, the town notified me that they were aware of that and they weren't gonna pay attention to that. And, but guess what they did. Uh, and then when I inquired with payroll who the change had been made from this scam email, uh, but it went to my town email account. I, instead of just saying, we'll ignore that and you, you all agree that and it was a scam email and I was informed of it from the town after I uh, made inquiry. No, I had to go through all the machinations of uh, going back to the bank, setting up a, a direct deposit. So I don't have great faith uh, in the town email. So. Um, I, I would not recommend favorable action on this because that control was taken away from me. It's a small thing. It's $111.63 a month. Oh, no, not $111. Sorry, $11.63 a month. But I also worry about what other parts of my private life through my town email account uh, could be compromised with identity, identity theft and the, and the like. So I, I can't in good conscience move favorable action on this. What, was anything done at the town IT level to remedy that from happening again? That sounds like a, a pretty big deal for town operations since everyone needs to have emails. No, I just know that the change was made from a fraudulent email to my town account that I had no uh, control over. So I, I didn't investigate it any further. I took about three weeks of steps to remedy that. So um, I would listen to my colleagues, but from my standpoint, it would be to move no action until we can kind of firm up 
those um, security measures before we open 252 people more to that experience. All right, and Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll second Mrs. Mahan's motion for, for discussion. And, and, and I wanna thank Ms. Henkin for bringing this forward. Um, I, as Mr. Dunn said, I think it's an interesting proposal. I, I'm gonna look back on my experience as a town meeting member, which, which is over a long period of time. And I am one of the town meeting members that, that uh, over the years it's provided um, an email address and, 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 and a phone number. And, and I, that I personally preferred that uh, when I was a town meeting member, but I, I think this is one of those ones where I'd, I'd probably be inclined for purposes of our vote to support no action, but I would be curious to see what town meeting members think at, at, at town meeting if, if there is a substitute motion. But I, I, um, it, there is a contact list that gets published on the town's website. And I do understand that there are some town meeting members who will put confidential for both their phone number and their email address. And they may be uncomfortable giving it, but they, the vast majority of town meetings members provide one or the other or both. And, and um, you know, just based on, on that experience that I've had, um, I'm inclined to support her motion, but I thank you for, for raising the issue. Mrs. Viggins. Yeah, um, so I, I had wondered I mean, uh, a while ago whether it's possible to just set up some aliases I mean, uh, so that I mean, you could get a standardized uh, format for the email address. I mean, the mail would not be hosted by the town. It would just be a pass-through. I mean, so I think that would be one possible remedy if it's technically possible. I mean, uh, I think the question is, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I haven't tried setting up something like that. I mean, I know that with technology, you can do pretty much whatever you want to do. It's just really a matter of whether you have access to do it that way. Um, uh, uh, and I'm just thinking of like solutions to the things that you brought up with respect to I me mean, separating your um, personal email I mean, from your town meeting business. You can always set up I mean, an alternative account. I mean, I mean, I know what you're going for is a standard um, format and, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Um, I don't have anything more to say at this point. Thank you. And thank you again for the detailed presentation. I mean, this is actually an article that I don't have strong feelings either way because it's really one of these articles that town meeting should weigh in on um, because it comes down to whether or not the expense is worth it as if our town meeting members think that they would rather have um, town email addresses versus just listing their their own personal email addresses. I can say I, I personally, from experience, haven't had experiences like Mrs. Mahan, but you know, I still log in just like I did when I was in college. I log in with my email address and password to get my town emails. And generally the turnaround time and response is a little more difficult than I know when people want, really need to get in touch with me, they'll either text me or email me to my work account. So with that, I mean, I would think to some extent, a lot of town meeting members would want to just keep the email addresses they have and having a separate email account for the town emails just creates another, you know, like another account that they might not check regularly. I know there's ways to fuse the two that are beyond my experience. But again, you know, I, I think it's fine if it passes and town meeting wants to weigh in on it. And again, I have no strong feelings either way on this one. So this is a public hearing. We do have one hand that's raised, two hands that's raised. So do we have Mr. Kaminsky? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, you can just say your name for the record. Yep, my name is Jonathan Kaminsky. I only recently moved to Arlington, though I've lived in the area for a number of years. Uh, I wanted to speak strongly in favor of this proposal or something very much like it. Uh, while I respect the logistical concerns, uh, what that basically boils down to is an excuse to avoid being contactable at all. Now, for the last two years, I lived in New Jersey. And if you want to see what 
uh, opaque, uncontactable politics looks like, you should spend some time in New Jersey. Because it was almost impossible to get a hold of anyone who had any decision-making ability over things that directly affected my life until a group of us campaigned at a county board meeting loudly and insistently that they put up at least some contact information for everyone. So even if the logistics of giving everyone a town inbox aren't in play, the fact that there isn't a requirement that they have some means of public contact, the fact that they can list confidential for both their number and their email is, I mean, it's basically just not acceptable. Um, so if not having giving everyone a town managed email account, at least giving them a mandate to have contact and offering the, them the ability to get a town email account if they don't want to put forward a personal one, seems like, well, minimal public service, if I'm being totally honest. All right. And thank you, Mr. Kaminsky. And Ms. Garber. Hello, I'm Judith Garber, uh, Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I'm strongly in support of this warrant article. Uh, I think it's a common sense policy that would uh, encourage also more people to run for town meeting if uh, privacy concerns are a barrier, which I actually have heard from a couple of people that expressed interest in running for town meeting, but were nervous about giving out their personal information. Um, and also like the previous commenter said to be able to have people more easily contact their town meeting member. Um, I'm also interested, like the, the FOIA concerns are also concerning to me as someone who is um, running for upcoming town meeting. It seems prudent to have your town and personal email accounts separate if someone um, could use FOIA to look at all your personal emails. Um, but I also definitely hear um, Ms. Mahan and um, others about some of the difficulties in setting up town emails as well. And for people who might not, might prefer to use their uh, personal emails as Mr. DeCourcy said. So potentially I would be in favor of, and also because of the, the cost of giving an email account to everyone, I, I would potentially be in favor of providing an option for all town meeting members who want a, a town email address to give them that option or for those who don't want that option to be able to put their personal email um, on their contact sheet. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And that will close the public commentation, comments on this Warren article. Um, Ms. Dickens? Would it be possible to table this in, uh, until we can maybe talk to someone from IT about the possibility of setting up aliases, you know, because that that to me is the the thing that the only compelling thing about this is the standard format for email addresses. Because as I said earlier, you can create another account, and that takes care of the the separation from your personal uh, account and, and and the the FOIA um, aspect of it. And, and with respect to um, personal safety. I understand that concern. I mean, one thing though is that I think people have to have their addresses listed, and, uh, so so they are reachable that way. And that is also another way that they can be reached. I Me, mean, I know we don't think about U.S. Um, P.S. mail as a way of communicating pe people, but it is there. I mean, and so they can always I mean, um, send them a letter. I mean, so they are reachable. Uh, that, that way. So it's really the standard email format that uh, is the thing that is compelling for me. And if IT could explain uh, the possibility of just setting up an alias that doesn't really be required an uh, email address, that would be good. Uh, if that's not possible, me, I hear you, Mr. Hurd. I mean, it's like, you know, um, um, we could send it to Tom Eden and see how they feel about it. I'll just add to that. I know that there are some town meeting members who feel that they are just there to do town meeting. It, uh, they, uh, they don't feel as if they need to do more than that. Uh, and I would say to residents who feel that that's not acceptable, uh, don't vote for them again. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. 
Is it done? Mr. J Chair, oh, Mr. Dunn, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so just a, a couple of opportunity to, to respond to a couple of thoughts that, I, that are points well taken from some of the speakers. But so FOIA is a federal law and it actually doesn't apply. What we've got in Massachusetts is the open meeting law. Uh, and the open meeting law is actually really very specifically written to not encompass town meeting. So like this member, this select board, we can't speak to each other outside of this uh, about business uh, with very limited exceptions. But town meeting, actually, the open meeting law doesn't apply. So uh, people who don't have to worry about requests to see their personal email uh, for being in town meeting, that no such legal right exists. That, that, that isn't something. And it is, tr it is an interesting idea, and, and uh, town council raised it in the memo that he sent to us, is that if we do this, it, that actually might hypothetically change because that town email address does become perhaps open to open meeting law um, re re review, but that uh, would be a whole new lawsuit all by itself, I think, because you'd have to figure out whether town meeting applied or whether town uh, email property applied. So I guess I, I, don't, I don't want anyone to not run because they're worried about someone going into their personal email. It's not gonna happen. Uh, my second thought is about whether or not we're providing an open and transparent government. And I agree that if someone isn't sharing a way to contact them, then um, they probably are not a great representative. And I would say that my, I would encourage, uh, but I think the solution to that is the ballot box. I don't think the solution to that is to put up an email address that they're just not gonna pay any attention to uh, anyway. If, we've got, if you have a town meeting member who's non-responsive and not interested in soliciting any input or receiving any input, I just don't think that, you know, the, the, the way to fix that is, is, is to vote them out. It isn't to just uh, put it up with something for them uh, on the website. Um, I do think that what they're, what part of what this is getting at that is true is that, that we, uh, we can do better on our town website about how to, re, how to get the town meeting members in for, we can do better about collecting town meetings informa members information, we can do better about how to distribute it, and we can do better ways uh, to manage the privacy concerns of, so, of some town meeting members. Um, I'm, uh, I'm definitely leaning against it because of the cost aspects. I don't think that the cost is worth it. And I think there, there are other solutions, but uh, I'm hesitating to actually make a motion uh, to see where it goes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. We have a motion. Ms. Ms. Mahan? Mrs. Mahan? Um, I don't think we have a motion. I think Mr. Dunn said he was hesitant. I, I'd move no action. So I thought you did move no action. This is, of course, the second one. But we can do it. If that's what happened, uh, then that's fine. I'll stand by that. Sure. Mr. Corsi, is that my was that my understanding? That's that's I I, I seconded what I thought. Not even was a late Mrs. part of the motion, meeting. so I'll second it again. Okay. All right. Do you have any additional comments? All right. We have a motion for no action by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Corsi. Attorney Hyde. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Thank you. Mr. De Corsi. Yes. Mr. Dunn. I'm sorry, Mr. Diggins. <laughs> Mr. Diggins. Sorry, I, I was muted and sometimes it's a little hard for me to unmute myself. Oh, mm. I do want to see this go to town meeting. It, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you know. I don't say no. Mr. No. Dunn. But yeah. I'm sorry, can I clarify, Mr. Diggins, are you voting for no action? For uh, I'm voting against no action. Okay. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Vote is four to one. Thank you, Ms. Hankin. Thank you. All right, that takes us to Article 26, Home Rule Legislation, Ranked Choice Voting. With Mr. Dennis. Mr. Chair, may I make a brief statement? Yes. Um, I just want to note for uh, the select board and members of the public that uh, Mr. Dennis and uh, I believe Mr. Foster contacted me to make it clear that um, the my explanation uh, for how the ranked choice voting would work in a, a multi-seat uh, race uh, was inaccurate. So um, I'll look forward to them providing you a little bit uh, more clarification on that. And I apologize for getting that 
wrong to the Election Modernization Committee, uh, the board, and any members of the public that I may have uh, confused unintentionally. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Dennis. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So as you may recall, so just to reiterate some of the comments I sent to the board, um, at last year's special town meeting, uh, the election modernization committee placed three articles in the warrant, and we were grateful to receive the select board's unanimous endorsement of all three. For a number of reasons, the complexity of the online uh, town meeting format being among them, we changed our recommended vote to no action uh, with the intention of postponing the ranked choice voting article uh, we changed just the third article, the ranked choice voting article, to no action with the intention of postponing it for this regular April town meeting. So as promised, we brought it back um, for consideration uh, by the board and by town meeting. We used the additional months to study um, some of the nuances of the application of ranked choice voting to Arlington town elections in greater depth. We worked with the vendor um, to look more deeply into the actual mechanics. Uh, and we made one substantive change to the proposal, which was to require um, it appear before the voters um, on a townwide ballot in the same way that it changed from an appointed to an elected town treasurer and maybe the appointed to elected uh, town clerk would appear before the ballot. Um, and that was something we anticipated would be required by the legislature anyway. So we felt might as well, and there was an amendment to that effect last year we thought might as well bake that into the language of the motion. Our reasons um, for um, putting forth ranked choice voting for town elections hasn't changed uh, substantially from the reasons we articulated in our report to town meeting last year. The goals of encouraging more candidates to run, um, thereby boosting voter turnout, ensuring majoritarian outcomes, uh, promoting diverse representation, removing some strategic voting incentives and fostering civil campaigns are the primary ones. Uh, with that, uh, so, you know, as I said, one of the things we did in the inter interim was to work with the voting machine vendor in a more in-depth way to get some of the precise mechanics of the implementation, get a stronger uh, hold on what those would be. Uh, one of the great things is that our voting machines already are used for ranked choice voting elections in jurisdictions around the country. And uh, the vendor sent us some sample ballots. I'll show one, some sample physical ballots. I'll show that in the screen here. You can see first choice, second choice, third choice in bubbled columns with the candidates down the left-hand side. And the voter um, is tasked with uh, marking their first choice in the first column. And then if they would like their second choice in the second column. And if they have a third choice, the third choice in the third column and so on. And those instructions don't change uh, regardless of how many seats are being elected. Those instructions are the same if we're in a single seat race or a two seat race or a three seat race. I have um, an example tally. We, set, we filled out um, 60 of these ballots by hand, sent them to the vendor. They did a tally for us and I have that to share if you'd like to see how that looks. And um, I'm happy to answer any other questions about the proposal. Thank you. Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Dennis. I, first of all, for all the work that you and the committee have done since you began on, on, on various issues. And I know you've been busy, had a lot of meetings and um, Really impressed by the fact that uh, you know, you're, you're posting your minutes, the, the, the detailed discussions are there, and, and you really can see um, what's going on. And um, I do have some questions, and, and I want to thank Attorney Heim for the clarification. I was a little confused, or not because I knew that it was it wasn't the right thing. It, it just I've been having a little trouble following this as, as well because this has really evolved since you came before us last spring it, it, at, at that time it, it seemed like there was a a simpler um bylaw change than 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 what's here now and um you know, we've had the experience in in november with while well, arlington overwhelmingly supported ranked choice voting across the commonwealth it wasn't supported but um i i just had a question for you in terms of um 
we had an experience last year with the clerk's race that had ranked choice voting been in place, it would have been applied because Miss Brazil won with 39% of the vote. Um, and as I look back on that election and, and how it ended, I didn't see a lot of people um, talking about, okay, I wish we had ranked choice voting to, to, to see what would have happened. So I, I, I've got some questions about this. I, I appreciate intent here, but um, I'd like to hear from, from some of the others, but maybe if you could just talk a little bit about what, how the recommended vote has changed since you had your discussion last fall, which I think a lot of that surrounded um, two seat, two seat races where how, how that gets divided up. Yeah, um, actually the, the recommendation hasn't changed, but I think there wasn't a lot of focus the last time around on how this is applied to multi-seat elections. And um, we've just had a lot more discussions about that. The only substantive change we made in the proposal was to require this go before the voters. Uh, there was another question in there. Uh, so it, it, with respect to the clerk's race, um, actually we, we, I heard a good number of people saying Oh, I wish I had ranked choice voting in the clerk's race, that I had preferences among those three that I wasn't able to express. Uh, if there was a candidate maybe I didn't like, uh, strongly didn't like, and I had two I kind of liked, one a little bit more than the other, and I wasn't able to indicate that nuance. And it could be that one candidate in the race might play a spoiler and, and spoil the chances of my first choice. So um, I did hear interest in ranked choice voting in that election. And one of the other phenomenons is that often people, I've heard from candidates that have chosen not to run because they are afraid they might split the vote or were told do not run because you will split the vote. And that's one of the key things we're looking to fix as well. Yes, we're trying to get to the right outcome when you have three candidates or four candidates in a race, but we also wanna have more races like that. And sometimes people choose not to run at all because they might uh, face this vote splitting situation. And, and just a question on outreach, and, I, and I, I think from your meetings in the fall, one of the um, concerns that you had in pulling the, the article from the special town meeting was because we're in COVID, you really didn't have an opportunity for public outreach. And, and, and unfortunately, we may still have those issues. So do you have concerns about the amount of outreach that can be done? And, and I'm not trying to get you to push things off, but I'm just wondering if... if how you've uh, addressed that situation, if at all. Yeah, we have less concerns this time around. Uh, last time around, you know, we had three articles. And so when we met at precinct meetings and when we talked to different groups, we had to talk about all three articles. And now we have one article in the warrant. So it's easier for us to focus and hone in on just this one. Um, we had a meeting with the, uh, we had a meeting with FinCom already. We didn't have a meeting with FinCom last time around. Uh, we've talk to um, you know, one of the proponents of, the, uh, of an amendment last time around was Adam Oster. And he had proposed an amendment and we had sort of a, I was able to briefly talk to him before town meeting last time around, but this time around we were able to invite him to our meeting and hear him out and discuss his concerns and talk through what we saw as the pros and cons of the different approaches. And then I also think at town meeting itself, um, that members are more will be more adjusted to the online format and will have the kind of uh, robust discussion that we need uh, to be able to hear this out and, and come to a uh, educated decision. So um, for those reasons, I think I think we can make it happen this time and, and, and uh, have the kind of discussion we need. Okay, and just in terms of timing, you talked about a proposal to go back to the voters. So if you can just lay it out as, as you're proposing it at a town meeting this spring, when, when would it go to the voters if it was successful at town meeting? So if it was successful at town meeting, um, you know, barring a special election uh, for any reason, then the soonest it would go before the voters is probably April of 2022. And hopefully by then the state legislature has approved the home rule petition. And so the first election under ranked choice on that timeline would be um, April 2023. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Mahan.
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move approval, uh, first of all, um, as Mr. Dennis, Greg, but Mr. Dennis has pointed out in the Election Modernization Committee, um, there has been uh, at least two years um, discussion, investigation, and information provided on this. One of the other things that was sort of um, a positive point for me was that along with the legislature uh, taking action is uh, the voters of Arlington um, also having a say on this. And since I have the bully pulpit, pulpit I'd like to take advantage of um, having Mr. Dennis and others from the election modernization committee or other Arlington residents. When this was um, on the state ballot before, and this is just an FYI, use this information not as a, a criticism, but just coming from me. Um, I received probably 50 to 70 through the mail, snail mail, or in person with the phone number attached, mostly from a uh, long time in some new time Arlington residents who were 72 plus that were confused by ranked choice voting and um, said to me, well, can I still just vote or do I have to do this ranked choice thing? And what I found out was after I did follow up with them weeks later, instead of answering the initial question, which for those voters, there's some people that just want to vote one way and that's it. And they see ranked choice voting as taking away that opportunity. Um, for If we could somehow get the message out, you can still just vote one person. Um, the, the answers they were getting was, well, your vote won't count because you can vote one, two, three, four, five, which they got the message that you can't, if you're confused by voting five different candidates and, and ranking them, your vote won't count. So if we can somehow get the message out, especially to that community that um, you can still vote the way you did if you don't wanna do ranked choice voting, um, but this is you know a, another way to vote. That, that's just something that I observed, uh, including with my own parents who are 82 and 84. Because what they said to me is, I'm 58 years old, but they call me baby G. They're like, baby G, we know nothing about politics. Just tell us when we, we should vote for you. And, you know, sorry to say that it looks like my parents just bullet me since I've ran since 97, didn't win till 99, but they don't get involved in politics and they're from that generation. So I definitely move favorable action. And I just want to pass that along since you are a captured audience. Um, that, that, that's been my experience. Thank you. That is helpful to know. Thank you. Ms. Diggins? I will second the motion, Ada, and I uh, appreciate all the, um, the links that you've sent me, uh, Ms. Dennis. Me and I uh, appreciate you know, the argument that it increases you know, the diversity uh, in those who are running. I was a little, um, um, I was a little surprised that on the negative be that a, the long-term um, increase in turnout, at least in one of the papers, was only a two to seven percent. I would have hoped it would be larger than that, but hey, we'll take anything. Uh, but um, that um, you 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 said that you have an example for us. You know, can we see? Yeah, I can. I can show you an example um, with uh, the permission of the chair. I can share my screen and, and show. Um, Great. Um, Mr. Dennis, the chair's screen. It looks like I have the option available to me here. Okay, so I showed the ballot earlier. Here is a sample ballot, let me, that has been scanned by the tabulator machine. So it works very much the same way. You feed the ballot in the scanner. Um, this is the information it scanned. Um, Three Musketeers is this voter's first choice. Almond Joy, their second choice. Werner, Werther Originals, third choice. Junior Mint's fourth choice. Pepper and Patty, fifth choice. Um, declined to indicate a sixth, seventh, or eighth choice, which would have been write-ins if they wanted to. Um, again, you can, as to Mrs. Mahan's point, you can rank just your first choice and leave the rest blank if you so choose, uh, or for just first and second. Uh, this was, they prepared for me a, um, five, a three seat race with five candidates, a two seat race with two candidates, with four candidates, excuse me, and a one seat race with two candidates. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't trigger ranked choice voting because there's not enough candidates running. In a one seat race, you would have to have at least three candidates. 
So this is how it is scanned by the machine. And this is the data uh, that it produced. If you can see that on your screen. So uh, I know we don't have a district town council receipt, but this is the vendor made up the names of the offices. Um, so it scanned that information um, in this format. And this information is stored in the voting machines. And then when the voting machines go back to town hall, that information is uploaded and tabulated. So the prot, which is the same process we follow today. So that process is all the same. I think people here, if they're familiar with how it's counted are probably familiar with the single seat case. What I have here is um, an example of how we elect multiple people using it. And it does become admittedly a little bit more complicated when you elect multiple people. What I've simulated here with is 60 ballots. And we try to create a situation in which a majority of the public, about 60% of the public, um, doesn't like mint flavored candies. They like Almond Joy, Three Musketeers, and Werther's Original, but they don't like Junior Mints or Peppermint Patty. But a significant minority, the rest, really like mint flavored candies. So we can see how that would look. Um, in a normal, in a single seat ranked choice voting race, you would be required to win 50% of the vote. So with 60 ballots, you would need at least 31, 30 plus one, 31 votes to win. Well, that threshold is too high if, you're, if you want three people to win. So the threshold, the number of votes you need is lowered um, to basically just mathematically uh, the, the amount at which you're guaranteed a seat. So it's 60 votes, three seats. If you do the math, you'll realize that once one candidate gets 16 votes, they are guaranteed a seat. It becomes impossible for a fourth candidate to get 16 votes. So once a candidate reaches 16 votes, they have won. And the tabulation starts by just counting the first choices on the ballots. And if we just look at the first choices, Almond Joy has 20 first choices, Junior Men's seven, Three Musketeers 12, and so on. Almond Joy has more than 16 votes and wins right away in the first round, 33% of the vote. Now, they have more than enough votes than they need to win. And this is the difference between the multi-seat and the single seat, not only the reduced threshold, but they have four more votes, Almond Joy has four more votes than they need to win. And we don't want those four votes to be wasted. We wanna maximize that voter's voice. And these voters had second choices on their ballots and Almond Joy didn't need all 20 votes in order to win. Now, if this were Cambridge, what Cambridge would do is an old fashioned way of doing it, which is, they would take four of these ballots at random and count them to their second choices instead. Well, that's not entirely fair. It's approximately fair, but it's not entirely fair because those votes go to whichever four lucky people uh, get their ballots chosen is counting towards their second choice. So what is done instead, the modern way of doing it is instead you take a fraction of every single Almond Joy ballot from all of those winners' ballots. So Almond Joy doesn't need, you can take away a, a fifth of every one of Almond Joy's votes and to leave them exactly at 16 and count that fifth of a vote towards the second choices. So um, if you look at Almond Joy's votes, of those 20, one had Junior Mint second, 13 had Three Musketeers second, three had Werther's Original second, one had Peppermint Patty second, and two had Nobody second. So you can count these each at a fifth of a value to, to eliminate, uh, to transfer four of Almond Joy's votes. And Junior Mix point, picks up 0.2 of vote, Three Musketeers picks up 2.6 votes, where this original point picks up 0.6 votes. And then you look to see if anybody has crossed the threshold of 16 votes. Uh, no one has. And if no one's, no one's crossed the threshold and you still haven't filled up all the seats, then you go back to the familiar thing from the single seat case of eliminating the lowest vote getter, which is the write-in candidate. And everybody that voted for this candidate, which was one person, um, has their vote counted towards their second choice. That one ballot had Werther's original second. So that goes to Werther's original. Still nobody is above the 16. So we eliminate the next lowest vote getter, which is Junior Mintz, which currently has 7.2 votes. Those get transferred to those second choices. Um, and 
Now Peppermint Patty is above the threshold, 21.2 votes, wins the second seat. And again, when somebody wins, you take their excess votes and their surplus votes and distribute them according to the second choice votes on those ballots, those get distributed. And now Three Musketeers wins um, the third seat. So a majority of the public, about 60% of the public didn't like Mintz uh, and they won, that majority won two of the three seats available. They won, Almond Joy won and Three Musketeers won. Uh, but the, the Mint voters uh, was formed, a, had a significant minority of the vote and they were able to pick up one of the three seats. And so when you do it this way, and this, uh, when you do the multi-seat election in this way, the tabulation, the tally, yes, is a little complicated, but what it gets at is representing the diversity of the views of the voters. So the majority of people wanted one thing, they got a majority of seats, but there was a significant minority viewpoint that was able to win one of the three seats. So um, that's it played out in its full glory there. Is that, is that helpful, Mr. Diggins? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I like seeing um, all the rounds to be calculated and you get a sense of how the, um, the fractional voting you know, um, comes into play. Uh, uh, all I can say is um, good luck explaining it. Uh, and, and, uh, 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 and uh, how, how do you imagine, well, how have recounts been um, handled in these situations? Um, <clears throat> they've been, I, I mean, there's places have recounted these, and it, you know, you, there's a couple different ways you can do it, but you can follow um, the standard tally just by hand. So you sort the ballots by their first choices and you see, you know, who's ever above, if that pile is above the number of votes they need, that candidate has won. And if not, then you look at what their surplus is and you calculate the, the fraction that you have to transfer. And so it's, it's doable. Cities and towns do it. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I mean, and essentially, I mean, they can, they, can, they can do it by hand in an efficient way so that, so for people who I mean, just have to have a hand recount, it can be done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's different because this is not following the Cambridge model. The Cambridge model requires that all the ballots stay in the precise order that they were originally. And so you right. have them around in the same order. Right. The, the fractional surplus approach, although it's, you know, more, you know, it, there's sort of like some math involved. Right. <laughs> which can scare people, although that's true. It means that you don't have to keep the ballots in order. It's, it's right. fair and precise and exact. Yeah, I mean, well, I prefer that they, I prefer this this way, you know, so. Yeah, the task the, for the voter though, so you put the tally aside, right? The task for the voter is tell us your first choice candidate. Do you have a second choice? Tell us your second choice candidate. Do you have a third? Tell us your third. You can stop whenever you want. So what is, what is incumbent upon the voter is relatively straightforward. Who's your first choice? Who's your second choice? That's it. Um, I think it is very important to have clear explanations of how the tally works, particularly in the multi-seat case where it's more involved. And there's a lot of different tutorials and videos and things like that for people who want to dig into it. But for the average voter, it's not, you don't have to know that. You just have to know who's my second choice. You know, do I have one? And that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. That's all for me. Thank you. Thanks for the example. Mr. Dunn? A lot. Uh, I definitely have questions, but I also see that Adam Oster is in the audience and has his hand raised, and so I'm going to wait until I hear more from him. All right. And I can stop sharing whenever <laughs> you would like me to. Yeah, I'm not getting confused. Yes. So my only comments, were, I mean, I, I, I've been impressed by all the presentations we've had on ranked choice voting, and I certainly understand the, um, the benefits of it in getting, you, you know, more voices to people that might 
not otherwise be able to get elected to an office. I think, you know, it came forward at the, spe the special town meeting in the fall and it got pulled back because of a lack of understanding. And I think to me, we change the way people are elected. I think, well, ultimately this will be the way we elect officials in Arlington because I, I think it is beneficial. I would like to see us wait maybe until to see if we had a special tummy in the fall or a tummy next year where we could have post COVID some real informational sessions that people that, you know, might want to attend in person or a little more dissemination of information about it, where I think when, when it comes to electing officials, we should educate both, you know, us as the board who are voting on this town meeting members, but also just the public at large. So before town meeting votes, we give the residents and the voters of Arlington an understanding of ranked choice voting and give them the opportunity to inform their town meeting members of how they would like to, how they would like their town meeting members to vote. We just had, talked about an article where we talked about discuss, the accessibility of town meeting members. So again, you know, I, I like everything I hear about it and I think it's, a, it's good for the town I just think we're, you know, we're still in this COVID bubble where it's hard to, to get people in a room and this we don't know how many people are able to or even willing to attend virtual based informational sessions where I think if we could push this out and make sure before this goes to town meeting that everyone in town is able to fully understand what it is their town meeting members who they elect are voting on. But you know, I'd certainly hear from the board a lot of support for this as well. And I, I know we've always been impressed by the presentations on, on this particular um, issue. But I'll also look for the public comments that we uh, that we get. And Mr. Dennis, if if you can stop, so I only have you on my screen. It's like we're having a conversation. So I, Sorry. I, that's all right. It was a very intimate conversation on a Warren article hearing. All right, so with that, we'll open up the public comment section of this hearing. And first up is Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to share my screen as well. Ms. Chaplin. So much for the enemy, see. Okay. I'm hoping it's more cat pictures, Paul. Uh, I, no, I did. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't get a cat picture in here. Uh, I, I will. Oh. If I'd known, I would have put one in. Uh, I'm looking for the share screen button. Is is it enabled? Oh, there it is. Uh, I'd like to urge you to take no action on Article 26 because no action is the right choice on when this ranked choice voting is before us. Ranked choice voting has a history in Massachusetts, as you know that in 2020, um, Mr. Dennis proposed statewide ranked choice voting, and there were a couple of commitments that were made at the time in the campaign. And if we go back and take a look at the initiative petition, uh, ranked choice voting would be used in primary and general elections for all Massachusetts statewide offices it would not apply to local offices. So when people were receiving a lot of information about ranked choice voting, they were told it would not apply to local offices. So nobody thought about it locally, at least during the campaign. The other thing that was made uh, public and was very prominent in the description that was sent out by the Secretary of the State is ranked choice voting would only be used in races where a single candidate is to be declared the winner and not in races where more than one person is elected. And that's very important to note 
because ranked for choice voting in races where more than one person is elected takes votes away from voters. The presentation you saw where Almond Joy won, that was nuts, by the way, um, took votes away from voters. So let's look at an election for three members of the Hogwarts Board of Wizards. Under our current system in races where more than one person is elected, voters have the same number of votes as seats to be filled. This ballot under a conventional method, the way we used counts votes for three candidates. So Ron Weasley gets a vote, Hermione Granger gets a vote, Harry Potter gets a vote, and Voldemort does not. In ranked choice voting, where there's more than one person elected, voters will have only one vote, one vote, not three, one vote, but they can rank their preferences. And this is a sample ranked choice ballot. If Hermione Granger is not the fourth place finisher after the first count, this ballot will count for Hermione Granger and only for Hermione Granger. If Hermione Granger is the fourth place finisher after the first count, this ballot will be transferred to Ron Weasley and will count for only Ron Weasley. Why does this matter? Because if Hogwarts has twice as many wizards as Death Eaters, under our current voting system in a race to elect three candidates, the wizards generally will use all three votes to support three candidates the Death Eaters will bullet vote using only one of their votes for Voldemort. And you'd end up with results something like this. You'd have Weasley, Granger, and Harry Potter winning and Voldemort trailing badly. He'd be defeated and life is good. But if Hogwarts has twice as many wizards as Death Eaters under ranked choice voting in a race to elect three candidates, the Wizards will generally split their votes among the three candidates, and the Death Eaters will cast their first choice vote for Voldemort. And you could end up with voting results at, like this after the first round. Weasley 30, 332, Granger 337, Potter 335, and Voldemort 502. And Weasley is defeated, and Voldemort, Granger, and Potter are elected. So Ron Weasley's campaign message under the current system right now is please give me one of your three votes. And it's a friendly message. Under ranked choice voting, Ron has to be more aggressive. He can't say give me one of your three votes. He says, please make me your first choice vote because the candidate can only rely upon the vote if it's the first place vote, because instead of having three votes, the voter only has one. Ranked choice voting doesn't remove strategic voting. It just changes the strategy. Ranked choice voting doesn't foster civil campaigns. Instead of sharing one of three votes, candidates have to be more competitive and more aggressive looking to get one vote and the top preference. Ranked choice voting doesn't ensure majoritarian elections because Voldemort wins without majority support. And our new voting equipment can run ranked choice voting, but just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. So we wanna make sure that edge election returns are aligned to election problems. Take a look at the issues that people have and the desires that they have to make elections better. And we need to make sure that election reforms do not create new problems. No action is the right choice for Article 26. And I'm urging you to vote no action on this article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schleckman. And Mr. Oster. Mr. Oster, if you could just say your name for the record. I think you need to unmute. 
way I thought that would happen automatically. Uh, thanks, thanks again. Nice to see everybody. Uh, strange to see everybody. Um, and I want to start by just praising generally the work of the elections committee. Uh, they've already produced actionable items for town meeting to improve elections, which we were able to vote on. Uh, I really enjoyed meeting with them. Uh, I almost convinced them. The vote was very close. They almost convinced me. Um, and I'd also like to thank Greg, who, you know, for, for talking to me at different points, but also for uh, sort of introducing this idea that the, uh, the process for the, that is proposed for the multi-seat elections, like for school board and for uh, select board, uh, really is kind of of difference. I would just add that um, there are other forms of ranked choice voting that are not like that. Uh, the, the proposal is really for a kind of variation of the proportional representation system that they have in Cambridge, although there are some differences. And uh, where uh, uh, Mr. Schlickman um, kept on saying ranked choice voting and RCV, I think he really should have been criticizing some aspects of the proportionality of it, um, not the ranked choice of it. And I'll try to explain that. Um, uh, but mostly I'd like to focus on those differences because that's kind of what, what, what my uh, testimony is about and what they mean in practice and how they would uh, affect the town. So I would also like to share my screen, although I'm not sure that I can. Is that an option I ought to have? Mr. Chapdelaine will enable that for you. You, sh you should have it now, Mr. Roster. Okay. This is... Um, This is really sort of it, but I wanted to sort of uh, highlight what I th think are some of the major differences um, between two different ways that you could do ranked choice voting with uh, two uh, multiple seat elections. And this, these numbers are for two seat uh, elections, such as you might have other, with the select board. Um, so you could do ranked choice voting that is very like the kind that people have sort of come to know about because of the question two campaign, where the threshold is a majority, it's 50% plus one. In the uh, proportional system, it would be 33% plus one. Um, in the majority system, you could cast uh, votes that would elect two people. Uh, in the proportional system, as, as uh, uh, Paul Schlichten pointed out, one vote elects only one person. Um, and I want to say that this is, some people might find this kind of a, a unusual idea that you'd say, you don't have to win a majority. Uh, you sort of constitute a faction and the majority faction wins the majority of seats. Um, I actually like that idea in a lot of ways. I used to live in Cambridge. I w helped a friend to win a seat on the Cambridge City Council using this system. Uh, and beyond that, I, I, I find ap very appealing the idea that more views get elevated in a setting where there can be a conversation, negotiation, give and take. Um, I think it's actually a very clever idea and it, that it can be very appropriate for legislative bodies. Um, I don't feel that way about an, a collective executive uh, like the select board. And I'd like to invite you to think about what's different. Um, so if we adopt this proposal, four out of five of you or your seats would be filled by uh, not a majority, but by essentially a minority block or faction. So under this system, you can't get more than 33% and a third of the vote. That's 
that's the idea. It's one member, on the other hand, is elected under different rules, which is another change. Um, select me board members would be answering to different groups. And by the way, if the select board continues the practice of just rotating the chair every year, then four fifths of the time, the board will be chaired by someone who is elected by only a third of the votes. Big deal or not, I just want you to think about it. I don't think that this changes who you are. I don't think that it changes your commitment to serving the whole town, uh, but I do think that it changes your relationship to the town. And I think that it changes your relationship to each other. Um, and that after all is the purpose of the change. It can also change who gets elected, which is also the purpose of the change. So I ask you to think carefully about what those changes will mean like in five or 10 or 20 years when everybody's elected that way. So uh, there's one aspect of it, sort of the Lord Voldemort aspect of it that I actually don't think is such a big deal, all right? But suppose you've got a member on the board who was elected on the basis of stopping the sinister takeover of the town by the MAPC and the MMA and forcing everyone to ride bicycles and raise their taxes and everything. And so they vote something like- Mr. Austin. Can I just ask I'm you, because you're going to, these are supposed to be three minutes. And I give, I've given you, got you and Mr. Uh, Schlickman the town meeting um, time frame, but you're coming up on seven minutes. If you could just. I write. beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I got a, a little carried away. Sure. No uh, I, I guess, you know, I think that there are some general issues and I have a specific concern, uh, which has to do with competitive grants. Uh, which aren't guaranteed and where we have seen um, are uh, sometimes awarded on the basis of how much public support there is perceived to be for the grant. We saw this with the Mass Ave project where the project was delayed for a year while the Federal Highway Administration had Arlington basically prove uh, that there was public support. And um, at, at that time, it was settled by uh, a unanimous vote of the select board. And I think the unanimity was important. Um, uh, I think it would have been problematic if there had been a member of the select board who had dissented at that point. And in fact, um, you might recall that the, uh, the leader of the opposition ran for the, for the, uh, for the board four times and drew 40% of the vote. Uh, under this system, uh, she would have been elected and that would have happened. And I don't know what would have happened after that, but um, I just don't think that it's in the interest of the town to have the executive board for the town be done that way. We've got a town meeting that's open. We have a process that's open. Um, I believe very strongly that uh, you know everyone is entitled to speak. Everyone is entitled to access a town meeting. We have um, a rule. Mr. That, uh, and if you could just wrap up your comment. I'm going to wrap up. Yeah. That the, uh, the the minority is absolutely entitled to be heard, and they're not entitled to prevail. Um, I did have more to say. I'm sorry I've gone on at such length. Uh, but I uh, just earnestly ask the select board to consider some of the ramifications of this, which I think are only coming to light tonight. Thanks. Nope. All right. Miss, um, can we have one more public commentator, Mr. Kaminsky? Hello again, Jonathan Kaminsky. Uh, I will be as brief as possible. Um, I just wanted to say, in uh, having heard Mr. Schlichtman and Mr. Oster's presentations, um, what I'm hearing is that a candidate who is effectively at 
who's effective at garnering first choice votes uh, among a minority will gain a seat. Um, and in response to the comment that the minority is entitled to be heard but not entitled to prevail, I would argue that uh, the difference under this new system is that the minority is entitled to be heard at the level of being represented in government, but they're not entitled to have a majority of the governing body regardless. So I primarily regard these concerns as a feature rather than a bug, um, given, you know, putting aside the specific examples that they used, in reality, giving the minority a representative voice is seldom a bad thing in terms of providing governance that covers every member of the population it's supposed to govern. Thank you. All right, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. With your permission, I've got a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Dennis. Yeah. Um, so Greg, with the, starting, I guess, with uh, Paul Schlickman's presentation about in his example, um, th is he broadly right about how his calculation about how that would turn out? Um, what, what he was incorrect about was that your vote is always going to count for one candidate. He is right that you only get one vote, but as we saw in the Almond Joy example, you may have, only, Almond Joy may only need, you know, 80% of your vote, and the remainder of your vote may count towards your second choice if, if they have more than enough votes. So your vote may count for multiple candidates. I, I'm, I'm not asking, so I, I hear you, I, he, the, the, but my question is, is the result different? No, he is right that like in that situation, the Death Eaters, right? It's a little bit of a, you know, a demonization scenario of the political minority, but the political minority, yes, in that situation does win a seat. As, as Mr. Kaminsky said, that's a feature, not a bug. Okay, thank you. All right, my second question is that it is exactly, it's along, those same, it's along that same line then, is um, what, so you so the why did the modernization committee choose that format as opposed to one that would have led to like so you like correct me if i'm wrong but like you you there are, you could have chosen a different voting system where the three would win and not the not the fourth yeah. um and but you chose to go this way which is arguably it should make I mean, proportional voting does seem to be like a reasonable description of it tell what are how did that thought process go what uh, what carried the day? Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about that um, in in the meeting that Mr. Oster was at and the meeting afterwards. Um, <clears throat> the The argument that carried the day was ultimately that it is going to do a better job of representing the diversity of the views of the public in that we should not be outcome oriented around looking to specific cases of, oh, somebody I disagreed with might've got a seat, but what is the principle here? What is the principle we're after? And the norm for multi -member, electing multi-member bodies around the world is with some form of proportional representation so that all viewpoints are heard in proportion to their prevalence. So if you, are, if you can capture you know, 30, a third of the vote, Maybe you deserve a third of the seats. You're not going to win. That viewpoint isn't going to win a majority vote on the board, but they will be heard. So that was the viewpoint that carried the day. As Mr. Ross said, it did come down to a close vote between our proposal and his proposal. And uh, I'll spend a little bit of time just distinguishing them a little bit. The ballots are the same between what he's proposing and not proposing. They're identical in the tally in the single seat case. They only differ in how it's tallied in the multi-seat case. And um, it was a close vote, but a number of the people that voted for his proposal voted for it, not because they thought it was superior, but, but because they thought it would be more viable both in front of town meeting and on a town wide ballot to the voters, that it would be an incremental stepping stone maybe to consider okay, maybe we could do it proportionally in the future. Uh, but uh, a, a majority of the committee said, no, we're, we're, if we're gonna change the voting method anyway, let's do the principled thing and let's do the method we think is best. So that is, that's the debate that was had. Um, hope that clarifies things. Thank you. Um, so 
I really enjoyed your presentation. Your presentation was really informative. Um, Paul's was really informative. Uh, I think Adam's got an, also has a really interesting point. Uh, for me, the the single seat is a slam dunk. Yes, in the multi seat, I think I'm probably wrestling with it in the same way your committee did. Um, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do think that, if I may say an additional yep. word, I, I do think that if your concern is the proportionality, the right solution to that is Mr. Oster's amendment, not no action. I think that is the right way to approach it. Um, but the committee does feel that the, the original as proposed is the best way of going about it. Any additional comments? Yeah, Mr. Corsi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, I, and again, I want to thank all, all three speakers tonight. And, and you can see from, and thank you, Mr. Dennis, for sharing how the debate went at the Election Modernization Committee. I had been told that it was a very close vote. And for me, with the information that was presented tonight, I, I, I don't want to vote no action, but I'm not um, comfortable based on what's before me right now to take a vote. I, I, I feel like we need a little time to, to absorb what was presented to us this evening. So I, I'm gonna to move to table this, Mr. Chairman, um, until I, I believe our next meeting is on the, the 22nd, because I, I'd like the opportunity, first of all, to hear from Attorney Heim, because I'd like to give him an opportunity to update the comments based on the conversations he's had. I'd, I'd like to take a further look at what Mr. Schlickman has done and what Mr. Dennis presented to us. and and. Mr. Oster sent us emails over the weekend, like an opportunity to talk to him as well. And they, they're all good points. And I think you know, we wanna get in the right direction, but I, I think um, you can show, you can see from this discussion this evening, how complicated it can get. And, and um, I personally am not comfortable voting one way or the other based on what's before me right now. Second. Mr. Dennis, can I ask you a question? Uh, so we talked about earlier that the goal was to implement this by the April 20, based on the time frame, the April 2023 election, correct? So was there any thought into having a ballot question next year and then putting this forth on the warrant next year, whereby the town meeting members would be voting right after the the town votes on the ballot question and then it, assuming it gets passed and passed that still gives about a year for the state to ratify the change before the april 2023 election we hadn't discussed that possibility um so in that case it would probably be some sort of advisory question on the ballot and then appear on the warrant I think uh, I might want Attorney Heim to weigh in on this, but the legislature usually require for electoral changes requires the voters have a townwide ballot where they uh, approve of the change. And I would want to have some, if we went that route, I would probably want some security that that advisory question would in advance of a town meeting vote on specific legislation would be sufficient for the legislature to view as um, enough of a ratification by the voters to pass it. And I'm not sure if they, I'm not sure if it, if it would, or if, if, if that question could be more binding in such a way, maybe it could be, I'm not aware if, if, whether it can. And I would say to attorney Heim, unless you want to answer that now, we have a motion to table if you want to take some time to to see whether that's an option. Sure, I'd be happy to present a, a sort of slate of options for the board. It's an interesting question about whether or not um, you can just put a ballot question on without it going to town meeting first for the accompanying special legislation. I'd have to think about it a little bit whether there's a way to do that. Yeah, and it could be that that's it's not possible. It's just one way to do it with where you can hear from the voters and then town meeting can vote based on on what they see from town results. Um, and it gives you that opportunity to educate people. All right, so we do have, we have a motion to table that's been seconded. Um, Mrs. Mahan, do you wanna withdraw your motion to approve based on 
Mr. DeCourcy's motion or? Um, um, oh, yes, I will. Um, if I could ask through you, Mr. Chair, yep. <clears throat> to Attorney Heim, if he could just address in his comments to us, am I correct or incorrect that if we went with a townwide advisory ballot vote, then we would have to go to town meeting for their vote, and then we would have to have an official townwide town vote. If you could, if that's the case, if you could say that in your memorandum to us, if it's not, if you could state that that's not the case. Thank you. I understand, Ms. Simon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so we have a motion to table that's been seconded. Attorney Hyde. Mrs. Mahan. I'm impressed you understood my question. Yes. I think I got it. You were talking about a non-binding uh, referendum locally and then town meeting. Do we have to then come back and have a binding uh, ballot question? I'll, I'll definitely look at that and, and make sure I, I got it. Um, yeah, that's what I, th I meant to say. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes on the motion to table. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote to table. Thank you, Ms. Dennis. All right. Closes more article hearings, brings us to final votes and comments. We have articles for review for final votes and comments. Article 12. Uh, Mr. Yes. Chairman, I say a quick word on yep. this. I just, uh, because I want to just uh, note that um, I got some feedback from board members, which is which is great individual feedback from board members. Um, some of these comments are easier to encapsulate the conversation than others. So I just want to make sure that all board members know that I'm very receptive to feedback and that the public knows that I'm trying to distill a conversation. If I get anything wrong uh, about it, I, I trust that the board members will correct me. It doesn't necessarily always on the first try perfectly reflect what can sometimes be complicated conversations about difficult subjects. I'm sorry, thank you, Mr. Yep, no problem. So actually, in the interest of time, as I call out the articles, we have the final votes and comments from Attorney Heim. Just chime in if there's any comments, changes, additions, modifications that you have on those particular articles. Then Attorney Heim, we can vote all of these in one vote, right? For final votes and comments? Yes, Mr. Chair. Article 12, bylaw amendment changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Article 13, bylaw amendment adding Juneteenth Independence Day to holidays. Article 78, resolution tree canopy as a public health resource. Article 80, resolution facilities department report Clarify responsibilities, track progress of the Department of the Facilities and Maintenance. Article 82, resolution advanced registration in organization of town meeting speakers. Article 83, resolution protocols for deliberative collaboration in town government initiated citizen. And that's where it leaves off on, on my agenda. Sorry, it looks like there's a. <laughs> That's right. Article 84, resolution formally invite Arlington Housing Authority representatives to present to town meeting. Article 85, resolution acknowledging native lands. Article 86, resolution celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Yeah, on that one, I, I, I had a, a brief conversation with Attorney Heim. But I also, um, we, we, Mr. Kuro had, had made the, the motion, I, I, I had a brief conversation with him and, I, and I, I hadn't completed that. And I'm wondering if the final comments on this one, um, if, if we could pull this and bring it back for the next meeting, because I just want to close that conversation and get back to Attorney Heim um, it, at some point over the next week or two. Yep. Article 87, resolution overnight parking waiver for residents of multifamily dwellings in precinct four. 
Article 88, Resolution Resident Parking Program for Precinct 4. Article 91, Resolution to Declare Climate Emergency in the Town of Arlington. All right, with that, I will see a motion. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Yep. I apologize. Um, I, I, I didn't get to, I didn't submit 91. It's an oversight on my part. Okay. So uh, 91 is, is, is still in the works uh, with, uh, okay. with, with park. Thank you. Yep. All right, so I'll look for a motion to approve article 12, 13, 78, 80, 82, 83, 84, 85, 87, and 88. Motion to table. Article 86. Would that be correct? That's right. Anyhow. Yes. Okay. Anyone? <laughs> Mr. Dunn? Uh, so moved uh, with a comment that uh, I've got, as you all know, I'm in an interesting position that. I have I missed a couple of hearings because it happened before I started, and uh, if I had a strong opinion that there was that I thought the board was heading in the wrong direction, I would let you know, and I would signify that with a vote. When we a couple others, I'm just uh, I'm 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 signing on to the work of of, of the rest of the board uh, without having actually had the hearing. I personally am comfortable with that. Uh, I, I believe it's how previous, uh, you know, new members have, have worked on it uh, or, in, in, and, uh, but I just wanted to really clarify that for everyone, what my attitude and thoughts were going into this vote. Yep. Mr. Corsi? Second. Any additional comments, Ms. Mahan? No, thank you. Any additional comments, Ms. Biggins? Uh, I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, uh, Mr. Hine did a good job of, of um, of summarizing things, you know, I, I think it's going to be incumbent upon me, me to explain to people me, that my dissenting votes aren't as dissenting as they seem. Um, it's more, I, I'm really very much on the same page with the thoughts and feelings about uh, how the board feels towards uh, uh, the, the resolutions. Me, my, my, my desire though was to see uh, these go before town meeting. And I want to explain what I mean by that because I used that phrase earlier today because as Mr. Dunn uh, has pointed out, I mean, everything um, will go before town meeting, but it's a matter of how it goes. I mean, when we vote uh, no action, you know, then then generally those things, those the things that we vote no action are put into the consent agenda I mean, and and the only way you know to get it to then go before town meeting is to put it in a substitute motion. Uh, and I know that people can do that way, but my intention was to just make it easier to get the resolutions particular um, in front of town meeting for it. make it easier. That's all I have to say on that. So uh, just one way to explain if my dissent is not as much of a dissent as it seems. Thank you. All right, and so Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve and one motion to table. Thank you, Mr. Heard. And, and just as a quick note um, for members of the board uh, and the public, I will plan to bring the entire report back uh, before the board, as has been our practice in the last couple of years, for a sort of comprehensive review of it, where if there's you know any further you know, thoughts or uh, elaborations with respect to like Mr. Dunn, your posture, uh, we can definitely include those things in the, in the report. So with that, uh, on, on the motion and a second, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, <clears throat> sorry, yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank, thank you. you. New business, attorney time. I just want to note that uh, uh, Representative Garbley's office has been in touch with me. They've been working hard on the uh, pieces of special legislation that were submitted uh, following the November special town meeting. And they're underway uh, with a few questions and uh, legal issues that they want to make sure are sorted out. These are a little bit more complicated than some of the typical home rule petitions we've, we've, we've put in front of folks with things like the uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, service lines and things like that. So I just want to highlight that and we're getting moving on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chaplain. 
Uh, a continued thanks to the Health and Human Services Department and all the other town departments that have been assisting them in providing vaccination clinics. We're, as the board knows, no longer doing first dose clinics, but we still have uh, remaining second dose clinics as well as senior housing and homebound seniors to vaccinate. Uh, they continue to do a great job. I know, I think the board heard some feedback from an attendee last week with just the level of care provided. Um, we'll continue to advocate, uh, as Ms. Mahan touched on earlier in the evening, to once again be able to vaccinate locally. But um, main thing I wanted to say tonight was, a, but once again, thank you to Health and Human Services and all the departments supporting them and the work that they've been doing. Thank you. Ms. Tiggins. Um, no comment, just a question. Do you think um, we'll need to meet on the 24th, uh, given the number of articles that we have? I just wanna have a sense of whether I need to keep that date open for another select board meeting. Um, I'll review the articles and I'll have the select board office get in touch. Okay, uh, thank you. Answer. All right, thanks. Time. Appreciate it, thank you. Yep, Mr. Gorsi. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman, just two things. Uh, first of all, I wanna Congratulate Maddie Kropelka, who was named the Middlesex League Most Valuable Player in Girls Hockey. Uh, only a sophomore, and I know we have a very proud grandmother watching this evening. So congratulations to Maddie on, a, on an outstanding year. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is this Thursday night at 7.30 is the continued public hearing in the, in the Mugar matter before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And unfortunately, in this environment, I, I think that that hearing, had it been a town hall, probably would have been jam packed. But I just want to alert people: um, it's one of the the, the last sessions before the public hearing closes, and it's uh, very important. I'm planning on attending, and, and I hope as many people as possible can attend that as well. Thank you. It's done. Uh, no new business. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan. Uh, no new business. Thank you. All right. And I did want to congratulate Ms. Kropelka's granddaughter as well, Maddie. I saw that as a sophomore. And I did want to acknowledge too, even though she doesn't live in Arlington, but my cousin's daughter, Maddie, was a Middlesex League All-Star as well on that team as an eighth grader. So, so the, Maddie's a good hockey name, I guess. Um, then I did just want to mention, so, you know, I serve on the park and advisory committee for the board. So as we meet on a regular basis now, so I do, we've heard a lot, particularly from Mrs. Ms. Dominguez in her Warren articles. And there's a lot of talk that's starting to come up with parking in East Arlington and parking in general. So I do intend to bring that up as an agenda item on our next meeting and see what, if any action that committee would like to study relative to the parking issues that we've heard over and over again, particularly in the East Arlington area. Um, and then I don't know that we're here yet, but I certainly want to talk to Ms. Chapdelaine about getting a timeline and a feasibility to start transitioning towards in-person meetings. I know some localities are, but just seeing what that looks like and, you know, what tech technology we need it would still be an option for both the public and members to participate remotely but if you know there, there is a way to make our meetings work a, a little more streamlined while we're all so at least some of us are sitting within the same room with you know PPE and what, whatever is necessary to make us safe I just want to see what that looks like and what a potential time frame for it is is for that. So I'll talk to Ms. Chaplain about that off air, but I just wanted to bring up that I'm, I want to start looking at that. So with that, I will take a motion to adjourn at 1030. Motion to adjourn. Second okay. by Mr. Corsi. Attorney Hyman. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Yeah, Ms. Vogue. Thank you all. Good night. Good meeting. Bye-bye.